I could not believe what I was seeing. I could have filled the back of his head with 556, which is an absolute joke. Well, it's not an ape, because if the Sasquatch was an ape, we would already have one. What are these elusive hominids that stalk the wilderness? Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevning. Welcome to the mystery. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Creek Devil. Carl's joining us today. Carl, how are you? Oh, I'm doing just fine, sir, and yourself? I'm good. Tom, would you like to kick this off? Yeah, absolutely. And before we do that, I just want to thank everybody for joining us. And if you like the show, please let us know. Click the like and subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. And if you want to be a Patreon, you can support the show. We have a link in the description. We've got Carl with us today. Um, Carl had an encounter at Ground Zero. He had it at Happy Camp, California. Uh, Carl, I think you said it was like 20-some years ago, back in 93, yeah. right? Uh, it was the uh, end of 93. Okay. Um, so tell us what you were doing, how you got there, what happened, and... Uh, we're interested in hearing this. You bet. Well, um, I had previously been leave, living here in Utah and um, really got tired of not really finding what I wanted here and didn't really know what to what I wanted. I don't know. I just enjoy gold panning and prospecting. I love mountains. And I really wasn't finding what I wanted here. So I went over to uh, Happy Camp. I knew the fellow that at that time owned the Elk Creek Campground, uh, Jim, and uh, yeah, Jim Jones. He uh, he used to own it there, and so I went up there, uh, got permission from a number of people that had claims. They're like, oh, you just go panning. We don't care. Just don't make a mess. Fill in your holes. You know, don't use any chemicals, and that's just fine. So I I did a lot of prospecting. You know, Indian Creek, Elk Creek, Bear Creek, and uh, a few others. And, uh, you know, got to know, you know some of the people that frequented the area. One fellow in particular, I don't recall his name. He lived up there by, uh, up in Josephine County, Oregon, uh, over by Cave Junction area. And he had, he had stayed in a yeah, camp trailer keep an eye on the logging equipment up there. And just back when they didn't shut down you know, all the logging yet, they still allowed some of it. And, you know, so uh, you know, I'd go up there at Bear Creek where he was camped and, you know, visit him, you know, every so often. And uh, I don't remember if I went up to visit him that night when I saw Bigfoot. I don't remember if I was going up to see him or what it was. I remember I went up there and was on the way back. It was a little bit nippy out. And I was just, you know, going down the road, enjoying, you know, the, you know, the cool air. And, you know, a little bike, you know, 50cc engine, very quiet, you know, real economical. Good bike for that, those kind of roads. And uh, I was just going down the road there, went around the turn, right about where I started going around the turn. I started hearing this noise, and, you know, I could take five or ten minutes to describe it, but it's just milliseconds how everything happened, and it's just, I looked right behind me and wondering what it was, and there it was. Yeah, you know, maybe it was he, maybe it was she, I don't know, but uh, it, it, was, it was Bigfoot, unless they had some... Uh, you know, unless, unless they had some tall guy running around in some weird, you know, monkey suit or something. Because, boy, I'll tell me, you what. Carl, let me uh, interrupt real quick before we get too yes, much sir. further. Um, I am interested. I think our audience would be interested in what were the noises that you heard that led up to you 
realizing it was Bigfoot? Well, I don't know if I could say it was the noise that told me it was Bigfoot. Cause it sounded like a flat tire. You know, when you're driving down the road, you know, in your car, and you got a flat tire, you hear it go, you know, flat, 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 flat. And it sounded very similar to that. And I'm on, I'm on a little motor scooter. It's not going to sound like that with a flat tire. It's going to feel a lot different if it's some, you know, if it's one of my tires. And um, I was just, that's why I was baffled. I just, huh, I wonder what this is. I looked back. And there's that flap, flap, flap right there coming from this big muscular creature. I say muscular. I mean, it is well built. Red hair. Uh, stood uh, at least six foot, I would say. At least. I'm five two, five three in that area. And uh, it was definitely bigger than me. And it was is keeping pace with me. And that was the first time in probably, let's see, at that time I was like 23. So it was probably the first time in 20 years I wet my pants. I saw that. And I was just like, uh, I, I got to get out of here. And I just, wow. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the thoughts going through my mind, it's like, you know, I, I've encountered bears. You know, I've been in a vehicle attacked by a bear before, and the feelings aren't the same. Uh, you know, it's a lot different being in a car, being attacked by a bear, or being roused by a bear, you know, compared to being on a motorcycle, being chased by Bigfoot. you got the car protecting you. You're out there, and you're just hoping you can outrun, you know, whatever is you know, coming after you. It's, it's terrifying. I, you know, because... Back then, we didn't have the internet. Back then, most of the stuff you hear are either some of these tall tales you see in the library and some of the fiction books that talk about Bigfoot, or you, you know, you'll hear rumors. And they, you know, back then, you just didn't really have access to real research on Bigfoot. And so it's always a myth. Well, I'm right there, and that myth is no longer a myth. That's the real deal. And I was just like, oh, wow. And I want to say I was praying, but I'm not sure those are the kind of prayers God want to hear because I was, I know I was swearing. And I just want to get out of there. So this thing was, uh, had red hair. And it's actually chasing you. And you saw it making the flap flap. Was that with its feet, or was that a vocalization it's, with its mouth? The feet. That was the that was the feet. Going oh, flap flap, yeah, chasing that, you. Yeah, that road is paved up there. You know, a number of the logging roads up there, um, they they go up there, they log it, and then roads that the county can use, you know, they'll go and pave them. Or at least roads that their loggers use a lot. I guess that's why they pave them, but it's it's asphalt. And uh, I heard it, and it was—I can't say it was loud. I can't say it was loud. I really don't remember how loud it was, but it's something noticeable. Hey, Carl, I'm familiar with that area. What uh, from Happy Camp? Which direction was it? Uh, Elk Creek Road. Elk Creek. You go from. Uh, Highway 96, go across the Klamath, um, uh, go over the bridge, and just follow the main road, and just keep going. You know, follow the road for about maybe, oh, I forget this, about maybe five or six miles, maybe more, that uh, over on the left-hand side, you got you know, some steep uh, country, like some cliffs. Yeah. Over on the right hand side, you got cliffs dropping down to the Klamath River, or not the Klamath, the uh, Elk Creek. Mm -hmm. And then you come up after a short bit, and you got a, a turn in the road goes to the right. It goes over a bridge, and then at that point, you pretty much lose in sight of the Klamath. You go up a ways, and like maybe a mile or two past that bridge, I think it is there. There was a small ranch on the left-hand side. Okay. And this, 
This was maybe a couple miles uphill from there. Okay. And I, I'm going to say it was, I'm going to say it was down below Bear Creek, but it's been so long since I was up there last. I don't know if I could be accurate on that. <clears throat> but uh, I know uh, it. It was terrifying, and it, it, it's terrifying, but it's also perplexing because I, I look at it it's like we know Bigfoot's there, but we don't hear anything about it. Yeah, it's they stay hidden. I mean, that's rough country anyway. Well, yes. Yeah. It certainly is rough country, that's for sure. And it's been my experience, most of the locals don't go looking for them, so. Yeah. Well, that, that buddy of mine up there, uh, my friend, that's doing the security work, um, I don't think I ever told him about it, to be honest with you. Now, I went down to, uh, oh, what was that cafe? Union Creek Cafe, I think. Is a right next to a bar in the the main buildings there. I forget the name of it. Yeah. It's I been... mentioned it in there and oh boy. <laughs> Next they... thing I know people are laughing at me. Really? I remember there was a guy he had um oh he had a shop <coughs> with uh I just it was kinda odds and ends, used things. I'm not sure exactly what he was selling. A friend of mine was looking for some gold panning gear so we stopped in there and, and i got to know the guy so every time we would stop by or come through happy camp i'd make a point of talking to the guy and and he was a pretty good source of information he was a little on the surly side but um we we got along pretty well and and he was willing to talk about the subject and he says oh yeah there's you know people see stuff all the time but they just don't talk about it mm-hmm. yeah well some of the people were telling me that it was really a bear that was chasing me. And they're like, are you sure it wasn't a bear? And I'm like, huh, this bike is doing 20, maybe 25. Yeah, you know the difference between bear and these things. Oh, yeah, bears don't stand upright and run that fast that far. No, I've seen I've seen lots of bear up there, and usually they're running the other way from you. Yeah, exactly. Um, even grizzlies. Uh, you know, only once have I had a problem with a bear. And uh, that was a long, 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 long time ago. But unless you provoke it with a bear, nine times out of ten, that bear is going to get away from you. Yeah, I've, I've, and, like I said, I've seen a lot of bear up in that country. And the only time I was ever spooked is we, we stopped and got out of the truck, and I saw bear, fresh bear tracks with cub tracks with it. And I oh said, boy. oh, no, we got to go right now. Oh, man, never miss the sound cubs. But, uh, and I, you know, I've always wanted to find out more about Bigfoot after this. But until I encountered the uh, Bigfoot Research Organization, until I encountered them, you know, you know um, did an interview with them and such, until then, I just, all I ever saw was just, rumors and stuff like a national inquirer and it's, it's it's pretty sad i mean you know we're talking about another you know biped sentient being and uh, uh, uh I, i'm just like really fascinated by it. it's like boy we need to learn more about this but carl let me ask you this when so this thing chased you how did this how did this all end? How did you did you get away from it? Did it run oh, away? Yeah. What what happened? I I kept going. I kept hauling butt. And that little that little bike, you know, it, you know, with me on it, it'll do no more than thirty miles per hour because you know that's a little fifty cc engine. It's a Honda Spree, and they're really not fast bikes. Um, you know, the, the older style fifty cc engines, and uh, it's just after a bit. And I was just, I was focused on the road, making the turns, making sure I didn't spill. 
And it's the point where I just wasn't even paying attention to anything behind me. I just wanted to get. And then after a while, I came up on that bridge, and I looked, looked back, and I stopped. And I was just like, I shouldn't stop here. I just want to keep going. So I kept going. And, uh, well, I was shaking. Uh, I was shaking good. But, no, that that were no bear. <clears throat> I didn't see that. You know, a bear can run that fast on four legs. But four legs they ain't standing up six foot either. Are you there, Tom? <laughs> you know, yes. do, you, do you know of anybody else? Have you heard anybody talk around the area there when you lived there that seen anything? I mean, that was willing to talk about it? Um, that was willing to talk about it? No. Yeah. Or, or do you think, I mean, Happy Camp to me seemed like it, it was pretty a pretty tight community, pretty closed mouthed. It, it is. It's a. It's it's more like a community of introverts. And well, small towns are like that. I mean, you, you don't be a socialite and live in a small town. Um, and that one's kind of a ways out, so I can see that. Yeah. yeah. There, there's, there, there's like two species of people there. I say two species. I don't say it's the right word for it. But it, there's just two groups of people. You have the locals, people that actually live there year-round people that uh, were born and raised there it's actually their home and then back then dredging was permitted it was allowed and so you had a lot of people that were into recreational mining some people you know were actually doing it for a living but they weren't really local and you know it, it seemed almost like there was uh you know, the, the locals didn't really like a lot of the recreational miners. And recreational miners were just not very, I don't know if I could really say that they were polite or impolite, but it's just almost like there's like a social barrier yeah. between the two groups. Not a real and friendly the locals, group. Yeah, the, the locals just wanted them to go away. And except for those that make money off of them, but they was like, you go do business with the local and then leave because they don't want you around. Right. Now, me, myself, I get along just fine with the locals, which, I don't know, just just me, I guess. But, uh, you know, so far I seem to get along just fine with them. But then I don't, I'm not a dredger, I'm not a logger. I don't go there to make a killing or off of, you know, you know recreational mining or off of logging. I, I can't explain it. Hey but Jerry, I, I I'm gonna I want to back up for a second. So <clears throat> earlier today we were talking about it, and I'd ask you for some of the details, the description of the creature. And yeah. you, I like your description. So if you could tell everybody what did it look like, and mm. you know the color of it, and you know what did you see? Sure. Well, it was about I'm guessing around six, maybe seven foot. And uh, I would say about medium long hair, red. And when it was running, I only took a, you know, a brief note of it. But when I look back on it, I'm like, it sure seemed like that hair was rather silky like. You know, he just, you know, I can't really describe it. It appeared to be silky like. But it was just, uh, it was coarse. But it, it did pretty well, you know, looking silky. And um, it was red. I mean, I looked at it in my you know, tail lights, and you can tell red hair from black or blonde you know, hair, even in, you know, the red tail light. Now, it was definitely red. And uh, it's certainly muscular. I don't, boy, I don't know. I wish I could answer it better on that, really because I only got a brief glimpse of it. Now, and this was at nighttime, correct? Yes. 
Okay, and we yeah. talked about that a little bit. Even at nighttime, with your taillights, if it had been black hair, you, know, you can tell. Oh, and, yeah. And the red hair is going to be lighter, and it's going to be uh, probably illuminated a little more by your taillight. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't say it was wider. It, it wasn't wider. You know, and the, and the taillight there, I would say that that red hair, I would say it looked more you know, deeper red. Okay. Now, this was, I believe we said, it's sometime in August, maybe late August. Um, what What time of night was it? Oh, boy, I don't remember. I'm sorry. It's dark out. I remember that. But it was dark, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was dark out. And, uh, boy, you know, I keep looking back trying to remember more about it. Um. I remember Jim, you know, thought I had been, you know, drinking too much when I told him about it. <laughs> that didn't seem too enthusing about it. Um, well, here's the thing. Um, well, I, I wish I could tell you more, but I don't know what else there is to say. Yeah. You know, we hear that. Uh, we had a guy named Jerry from Ohio, and he was accused of drinking. It's like, look, there's no law that says you can't drink. And it's not your fault if you've been drinking and, you know, you get accosted by one of these things. That That's what happened to this gentleman in, in Ohio. So, um, Well, the, the, the discussion you know, when Jim brought up about, you know, that I had too much to drink, it's like, oh, that's just fine, but I don't drink. So it's like you know, I had at that point, I'd been dry for since spring of 93. So it's like up there when I was in California, not a drop. So it definitely didn't flow with me. Yeah, I bet not. And, you know, that's what they're really saying is. It sounds like they're saying we don't believe you. There's got to be some other explanation. And they start grasping at straws. So um, and you drank know, or what have you. You know, what's funny about Happy yeah, Camp. Funny. This happy camp has all kinds of carvings of Bigfoot all over. They they capitalize or try to capitalize on the image, but then they have that attitude. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's sad. It really is. <clears throat> I just, I wish that there was more information from legitimate research on Bigfoot. But other than you guys and BFRO, I really don't know of any others. Well, we can we can share some stuff with you, Carl. I know I've I've been wanting to go back to California. I want to go back up there to Happy Camp, and and yeah, you know, if I had a chance, I'd sure like to meet Bigfoot again. And this time, I don't think I'm going to be running away so quick. Well, you want it? You want a um, a heftier motorcycle? <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be a little fifty cc. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, listen, Carl, I, I want to thank you. I really do. And this is an interesting story. Uh, I want to say also thank you to Will because he's got a lot of local knowledge there and knows knows the area very well. So, kind of paints a, a little richer picture of of the whole encounter listen um carl thank you again and stay on after the show and will's going to share some information with you carl we appreciate okay. it man you bet so you just want me to stay on the phone then yeah just for a bit okay that works all righty thank you again In Bigfoot History, Northwest Territories, Summer, 1952. Murray Lloyd of Yakima wrote to Roger Patterson that while in camp one evening, he saw a creature about 9 feet tall and quite heavy, standing by some blackberries about 75 feet away, watching him. After a few minutes, it walked away. 
Roger's notes give no location. Welcome back from the break, everyone. Let me make an announcement before we get started. Uh, we were going to have Janae on today's show. She lost power and had some problems at home, so she had to reschedule. We're going to be recording her tomorrow for next week's show. So I want everybody to know that, that we're looking forward to hearing from her. So, Tom, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Sure, you bet. Okay. Uh, first question is from a gentleman named Derek. He sounds like he's just getting into this. He says he would like to know if a newbie just beginning to get into the Bigfoot research, going into the woods, etc., can discover valuable information about Bigfoot that would be useful for other researchers to use and possibly build from. Yeah, I think so. The first thing to do is get my, my book, Bigfoot Fieldwork 101, and then that'll get you started. Yeah. Absolutely. Shameless, shameless plug there. <laughs> shameless, totally shameless plug. Yes. <laughs> what, what do you What do you guys think, though? What are your opinions? Let's go around the table. Your opinions on that? Okay, I think, you know, whether you've been doing it like you have for close to fifty years, or you started last week, uh, everybody's got uh, kind of an equal. Um, Everybody's equally welcome. Everybody's equally valid to get into it. It's a fun thing to do. Um, stay safe. You want to, whether you're researching Bigfoot or elk or anything out in the woods, I would say uh, never go alone. And uh, it's an interesting topic. Milo, what do you think? But to me, all information is good as long as you got open mind. So the more you know, or I don't think there's one specific way of learning how to check this down. Cause every time you do it, it's going to be different anyway. Forrest, what do you think? Well, oh, there you go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Thanks a lot. Lion. Behave my <laughs> Um, <laughs> With my instance, uh, it seems Bigfoot found me rather than me going out finding Bigfoot. But uh, regardless of that, I think that, um, you know, just a, a basic structured, uh, you know, plan out what you're planning on doing and uh, stay safe, definitely. I would go armed, and I would never go out there by myself. I mean, uh, at least one or two people accompanying you. So, um I don't think that uh, uh, in any situation, whether you're tracking grizzlies or uh, elk or deer or whatever, you know, you should always be careful and uh, safe. And you know, with this subject, I agree with that. You know, with this subject, (laughs) you never know. You never know what you're going to come across, and so it really doesn't matter if someone is, you know, well seasoned or if they're brand new, uh, because anybody could trip across something. It could be very valid. Okay, Tom. Exactly. Next question. All right. Um, I don't know who wrote this one, but they wanted to know about uh, Bigfoot teeth. What is known about Bigfoot teeth? Do they have the same number as humans, uh, 32? And I've heard that they have two rows. And I want to comment on this in just a second, but they have double rows of teeth. Uh, has this ever been seen? And what about juveniles and baby teeth? Do other primates have a primary set of teeth and shed like humans? Has this been seen with Bigfoot? Um, and I want to talk about the double row of teeth because I I read something on this a while back. And a lot of people think a double row of teeth means you got a row of teeth on on the uppers, and then on the uppers you got another row inside, and same thing on your lowers. That's not what it means. What it means is, well, it's going to be a shock, but I got a double row of teeth. So does Forrest. So does Milo. So does we all do. It just means a double row of teeth means you have uppers and lowers, and that was 
the way Dennis would describe teeth back in the day, back, I think, like back in the early 1900s, 1800s, um, so forth. I don't know. Forrest, what are your thoughts? <laughs> well, strangely enough, uh, somebody questioned me about this once upon a time, and I actually went on a mission to look it up. Um, now, whether you want to call it double rolls of teeth or, or what, um, there are people that actually occur in the human population that do have um, multiple rows of teeth. They will have a set on the outside just like what's normal for us, and then they will have <clears throat> a set on the inside growing. Um, it's very, very rare, but it does occur. Um, I have never seen this or ever heard of it occurring in any other type of primates other than humans. Um, all primates have baby teeth, just like any other mammals have baby teeth, and they lose them, and then they grow in permanent teeth. Uh, the canines are usually the last to come in. Uh, this is uh, true in the majority of all primates because uh, those teeth are used in uh, monkeys and apes as a defense mechanism and so uh, the reason they're, they're the last to grow in is because you're going to have to have the body to possess uh, those type of canines to back up basically if you're showing your canines to uh, you know as a defense mechanism you're going to have to have the body to back that up so that is the last to uh, come in in your primate groups and now we, I know that uh, Will has talked about some Bigfoot having pronounced canines and then others having big blocky teeth like chicklets. Um, you know, all primates have big canines, um, but they also, uh, your uh, gorillas and chimps have uh, a dentition almost identical to humans. So um, I don't think anybody's ever discovered uh, teeth owing to a, uh, a Bigfoot. So, uh, I mean, we have teeth for Gigantopithecus, Blackie, but, uh, and they're big, big, large, big, large uh, teeth. So I would assume, I'm assuming, because of the size of Bigfoot, that they would have uh, larger dentition as well. You, you know, it made me think of an old saying when you talked about, you know, the, the canines grow in later because you need the body size, that sort of, along the lines of the saying, uh, you know, don't let your alligator mouth overload your canary backside. <laughs> right, exactly. You know. But, but yeah. yeah, that's that's well, what I... I always, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I always thought the when they talk about these giants that they find and they have double rows of uh, teeth, I actually thought that's got to be a bunch of malarkey. And I looked it up and, and went and pulled some books and stuff and I actually even talked to my dentist, and he said that it does occur in the human population. It's very, very rare, but it does occur. Is it a mutation or some sort of a, um, like a, you know, genetic uh, carryover? Or what? Any thoughts on that? Well, I don't know what it would be a carryover from because I've never seen any type of, uh, in paleoanthropology, any type of... Uh, finds where they have that has shown up so I would assume that uh, it's a mutation and whether or not they've actually been able to single out the gene that uh, causes that I have no idea I'd have to plead ignorance on that yeah I mean there's there's a number of anomalies that do happen in people periodically you know not just teeth like that but there are plenty of other examples so I, I suppose it's not unheard of but as a rule, right. but as a rule of thumb, let's say for the Sasquatch, they probably don't. They probably have teeth very similar to ours. For the, oh, I would assume so. Yes. For the exception, and and like I said, you know, there's uh, the two major groupings. One grouping has the blocky teeth and and the small, non-pronounced canine like ours, uh, because we have canines also. And then there's the others that are very pronounced canines. Okay, so I just want to go. I want to make sure we tackle every question here because I did sort of, I kind of jumped the gun a little bit. Okay, 
So do we know, do they have the same number of teeth as humans? Well, there's no way of knowing it. Nobody's ever come up with a skull or a mandible or anything else. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to assume that they would uh, would have the same number of teeth uh, as we do in uh, other primates. There's, a, there's slight variations between uh, primates, but uh, uh, basically it's all the same. So, um, Well, for us, that's actually a good, good point. Then being a primate, they would probably be the same way. So do chimps have 32 teeth? You know, I've never counted them, but I'm going to, now that you <laughs> say something, I'm going to look that up. But, uh, I mean, they have basically the same uh, formation in the teeth, you know, two, two uh, incisors uh, upper, I mean, excuse me, four incisors upper and uh, top and bottom, uh, the two, two canines uh, top and bottom, uh, two premolars, and then uh, the, uh, so, but the thing is, are you counting with, uh, they don't have what we have, like uh, wisdom teeth that come in. So, um, you know, if you're counting that as uh, part of the, the 32, then uh, know that they would, uh, those might be different. But I'm, I'm going to look that up because, you know what, that's not something that I ever actually. Yeah, I think. I think I recall from I think I recall from my I haven't been the inclined in mind. <laughs> yeah, I want to say from my coursework years ago, they talked about uh, chimps and gorillas having, and it, it's it wasn't the exact number, but it was very close. And I can't remember if they were one or uh, two, two or four less or more. I think it was less than what we have. Well, are the wisdom teeth part of the thirty-two? Um, some, I don't recall. For some people, it actually is. Yeah, right. <clears throat> okay, and then the last question that this person has is, are the large canines uh, seen on some of the Bigfoot types, are they limited to the males, or do both sexes have it? Any any thoughts? Uh, from what I've heard, I, I think both sexes have them in the ones that have the pronounced ones. Okay. Very good question. We actually have some really excellent questions this week. Um, Skylar. Skylar. Will, we know who Skylar is. Yes, we uh, do. <laughs> Hi, Will, Tom, and Forrest, and Milo. Here's a couple of questions I thought I'd ask for the podcast. Uh, if someone was to encounter scat or hair in the wilderness, would either of these items be worth collecting? And what would be the best method of collection and preservation? And he's got another question. But let, we'll answer this one first. Forrest, what do you think? I'm sorry. Uh, we were talking about the preservation of scat. And, and hair. Well, and or hair. Yeah. If someone were to encounter scat or hair in the wilderness, okay. would you, um, would you, take would you a consider either of one of these? Where it was? I mean, if you could, or would that be... You know, well, go ahead, Ma. Uh, I was thinking more like, you know, in relationship to where it was on the ground. I mean, if it was like hair, was it like eight feet high? Was it in the trees and the bushes? You know, I understand the scab, but I mean, I would like to take pictures of where it was in relationship to where I found it. Oh, absolutely. If it was me. Absolutely. You want to document it before you do anything with it. Yeah, that's a good, I, I even even more take field notes and stuff with it. Well, hey, I was here at this point and wrote it down and I took a picture of it. At, you know, yeah, I had, that's the way I would do it. Well, anytime you're going out in the field to do such as that, you need to have uh, equipment that you're carrying with you that, uh, that you have set aside just for that, you know, <clears throat> mm -hmm. that would be sterile. Uh, such as uh, tweezers or something, uh, something of that sort, that you could pick it up with. Uh, uh, you'd need to carry sterile gloves uh, and uh, Ziploc bags that. Uh, oh, um, let me let me back are, up a little bit there. Yeah. What you don't want is Ziploc because the plastic, the fumes that plastic gives off, can alter the the uh, hmm. organic material. What you want to use is sterile white paper, like an envelope. 
Uh, okay. Well, see now, uh, we used to use uh, Ziploc bags for putting stuff in. Well, so I, I found I, this out. I was not even aware of yeah, that. Yeah, I so found this I, out. I have learned something new. I found yeah. it out years ago <laughs> with a, a, a guy that I used to go to the field with, and and he was pretty knowledgeable in those kinds of things. And and I took some Ziploc bags with me, and he says, oh, no, you don't want to use that. I said, how come? He says, well, plastic can get, give off fumes that will alter organic material uh, or infect it, you know, so the results would be off. So he says what you want to use is just plain white bleached paper because that's sterile and it won't affect uh, whatever material you collect it in. You know, or uh, I used to carry also, I used to get these little, uh, they kind of look like test tubes, sterile glass uh, with cork. And the cork is uh, also... Uh, something that doesn't affect organic materials. Okay, yeah, so well, here's a question. Was, uh, perfect, perfect, yeah. How big of a envelope are you going to need? <laughs> to put the poop in? <laughs> right. Know, Tom, you don't put poop in an envelope unless you're sending it to somebody you don't like. <laughs> you're going to need a Safeway bag. <laughs> no. Oh, heaven. So well, how about like evidence bag? Would that work? Would I mean, what's, come in handy. <laughs> what's the difference between an evidence bag and a plastic bag? I mean, well, that... again, the plastic, you know, it the, it gives off, it can give off fumes depending on you know the manufacturer, I suppose. Great, it goes off my sandwich. But means. well, but <laughs> I, I think some of the forensic kits actually have um, paper bags. Uh huh. Huh. Well, now that you say that, you know, when you're watching uh, some of these uh, uh, forensic shows, uh, they do actually use, like, um, um, paper bags, that, uh, like lunch bags. So that exactly. might be something there, you know. But, I, I, you know, that, that we always, I'm not lying, we always use Ziploc bags when we were in the field in archaeology. I don't think any of us were ever aware, and I certainly wasn't. And <laughs> you just told me now that there was a... A problem with plastic bags. Yeah. No one had ever said anything to me at all. I, I ever, wasn't, ever, ever. I wasn't aware I, of it I've either. I've been practicing in stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends. I, you know, there's a lot of things in life. It really depends on who you come across with their knowledge set. You know, because every, everybody has different things they've experienced. So I just happened to come across and, and work with a guy who, who was familiar with all that uh, the forensic stuff and and he explained some of these things to me, so I changed my methods of, you know, how I was operating, doing things, and and, and I would say even for things like here, what what you want to do is carry a, you know, carry a micro. Um, um, I can't think of the word. I'm, I've been up since three a.m. Magnifying so I, glass. A magnifying glass, exactly. Carry a magnifying glass, and and if you, and I do this for the for the trees, the ones that are broken, the territorial markings. And, and Tom will tell you, you see me do it. He'll spend time in the field up, my face is right up on, on the tree trunk, examining every inch of it, looking. Because you're not going to find just big tufts of hair on a tree from a Sasquatch. You might find some individual strands, you know, if they happen to brush up against it or something like that. Uh, and that's where you want to have a sterile, sterile tweezers. But the magnifying glass is, you know, very useful. You know, you're out there, you might... You know, you look like uh, you're, you're the inspector out there looking at stuff, but you know what? It's a very useful tool, and it's just a little thing you want to keep in your uh, pocket because uh, that's how sometimes, you know, you look at something with your naked eye and you might not see anything, but pull the magnifying glass out and really get close to the tree trunk, and, and you can very well come across hair. That's really interesting because then I wonder if you could get, like, latent palm prints or whatever off of stuff like that well i've got pictures that people have sent me tom tom you even had prints on your truck i i don't know, I don't know how many prints oh, yeah. i have photographs of from all across the country mm -hmm. where there's either hand prints with finger uh finger prints on them one truck in fact a guy sent me on one side of the truck that had hand prints fingerprints on it and his brother-in-law was a actually a a senior crime scene investigator for a major city uh, who prepared the prints. They took photographs of them, but before you could lift the prints, it rained. Uh, but at least we had the photographs. But on the other side of the truck, 
there was a nose smudge. <laughs> an oily a nose, nose smudge. Yeah, where it put its face up on the glass. Wow. So, yeah, I, there, I have plenty of pictures of stuff like that. So, yeah, absolutely. So do you have... Well, what I was thinking... I was going to say about the uh, the the poop part. Uh, when you're uh, testing poop like that, you need to actually uh, pull multiple samples out of that because uh, you want to try to pull off something from where the end of the the last part of the poop comes out, and uh, then you want something from the middle part, and then you want something if you can get to it uh, that would come would have been that first came out. Uh, that would be the, the best way to provide any type of uh, <laughs> DNA because the cells actually slough differently in uh, the different parts mm. of the, the poop sections. Yeah, they, it, it's picking up the <laughs> DNA off the lining off of your large intestine, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Now, that's a fairly expensive test to have done, though, isn't it? Oh, heavens, I don't know. I mean... Uh, I never uh, was involved in, in the cost. Now, uh, I mean, I never had it personally done, from, you know, from my perspective. But, uh, uh, you know, when I was going to school, they all, <laughs> the school handled all the costs of that. So I, I would imagine that it's not a cheap test, no. I, I know that, you remember we talked about the uh, the deputy sheriff who took the blood sample off the kid's bike and, and ran it in for the cheap test you know the twenty dollar test and it was gone for a year and came back and the the sheriff called him in and demanded to know why their department were spending forty thousand dollars for this comprehensive dna test (laughs) yeah he wasn't a happy camper and the poor deputy says why you know that wasn't what i put it in for the lab made the mistake so i i think they're fairly prohibitive cost-wise I mean, you know, it, it's a part of this. Hair and scat are definitely a part of the subject, um, but their value. I mean, I think that goes back to the question: um, could be negligible just because of the prohibitive cost, you know, of having a test done. Well, and it's so easy to have cross contamination too. So, I, I was just uh, you know, that's that. where you have to. You just have to be so, so, so careful. And then, you know, you go through and spend all this money having the test done and then find out that everything was due to cross-contamination. I mean, that's rather... And I uh, can tell you, I've seen many you know, people who have gone with me to the field, they find a hair, you know, whether it was Bigfoot hair or not, they thought it was, and just stuff it in their shirt pocket with their hands. Yeah. And I thought, well, yeah. that's it's worthless now. And then you wonder why some of these samples come up with human DNA all the time showing up. Absolutely. On Absolutely. So, Tom, where are we at? Did, did we answer all the okay. portions well, of that we're, question? Or? Okay, we're still with Skylar. Okay. And Skylar says, in the uh, unlikely event that somebody was to come across a freshly dead Sasquatch or even a piece of one, would there be any piece of the body worth collecting and preserving? And if so, which piece and why? such a thing were to occur um who would you who would you take it to who, who would you present well, it to for uh you know for disclosure of faith hey, look at what call, we found call me i know where to i know where to take it we have scientists okay. we have scientists okay uh, and so the other part of the question is um is it worth collecting and which part well, I don't know. Forrest, what do you think about a, a body part? Well, as crazy as it might sound, I'd look the head first. I was thinking that, but you'd need a chainsaw. <laughs> well, well, no, uh, it depends how long it's been dead. Very strong man with an axe. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, that would be the first thing I'd want. I mean, a head can tell you so much about an individual. Oh, true. I mean, true. Uh, because you have the look teeth at and all everything. your ancient ancient finds, you've got, uh, you know, the t- the head can tell so much. I mean, the dentition as far as uh, um, ha- what they ate, how they ate, and uh, age and everything else. And the skull can, oh, I mean, it's just a myriad of things that can be told. And I just, uh, I did go in there and I did verify it's 32 to 236 on uh, 
far mates. That's so, what it was. I, I yeah, knew it was a little them, bit. But all in the same field. Yeah, I knew it was a little bit of difference, but not too much. One of the things yeah, I wanted to well, mention. Yeah, I did too, but I wasn't, I wasn't exactly sure because it wasn't something that I have necessarily yeah. made a uh, study on. One of the things I want to mention too for people, if there's a biological sample you found that you were pretty sure was Bigfoot related, um, and I'm, I'm not sure hair would fall into that unless you had, you know, the roots. But as far as preservation goes, you want to freeze that stuff. Because it, it'll last longer between the time you collect it and whenever you take it to get tested. Hmm. You don't think freezing would damage anything? No, not typically. At least that's what I was told, so. Okay. Well, we want to put it to the test. We just got to go find it. I had poop I brought back one time and put it in our freezer. My girlfriend at the time was not very happy about that. <laughs> oh, gosh. Maybe, maybe this is the reason she's a former girlfriend? <laughs> For? There are possibilities there. <laughs> I'd be like me going out and picking up squatches poop out in the yard and put it in their freezer and Jeannie see it. Yeah, that would be about, yeah. I don't see me doing that. <laughs> okay, Tom, did we answer everything for Skylar? Okay. That was, okay, so those are the questions Skylar has. All right. Thanks, Skylar. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. A couple of questions. Um, this person has heard us mention on a recent show that our main goal was to prove the existence of Bigfoot uh, to the public, does that ultimately require tracking down and killing one uh, to obtain a definite specimen? And what would be the main way to prove it finally? Well, I can tell you, most scientists would say that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to one on the, have one on the slab. And I've, I've spoken to a few, especially, you know, our friend John, who's a forensic anthropologist, and without batting an eye, that was his response. He said it's not it's not unheard of. You know, it's very routine in, in uh, science to do that, to take a specimen to, you know, prove their validity. Well, that's what it takes. Okay. Well, uh, what do you yeah, think happens? What's that for us? No, I just said that would be the only way to prove it. I think we're at that point. It's it's probably the, you know, that's where the line is drawn, I think. You know, for it to be concrete in everybody's minds. But that I think it would be a chore. But that doesn't mean, yeah, that doesn't mean for anybody just to go out and try to do that because you got to contend with the rest of the group. So you might take a pot shot at one, the rest of them are going to have you for lunch. <laughs> okay, next question is, same person, what do you think happens to the science world and broader society once it's been conclusively proven? Hmm. That's a good question. I don't think I could give any one answer. What do you all think? Well, well yeah. I think the product will react, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's, I think it's kind of hard to predict. I think... Here's my thoughts. It's just my opinion. I think it would be very exciting at first. And I think it would be sort of like the moon landing. There would be a lot of initial excitement. And then it would kind of become normal with the exception that <laughs> the moon landing, we come back, you know, okay, great. You know, 12 guys went to the moon. Here, they're still with us. It's still going to be in every day-to-day uh, -day thing in the areas where the creatures um, live. So, Why does Jurassic Park come to mind? At first, there's right? oohs and ahs, then there's running and screaming. Screaming, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, the, I, I think it's going to... <clears throat> I view it kind of like the uh, UFO situation where... For so many years, uh, since <clears throat> I can remember being a little girl, 
that people always said that if uh, the the general public was made aware that UFOs actually really exist, that we were all going to go crazy and and there'd be riots in the streets and uh, all the Bible thumpers would be losing their little minds and and then what happened this year? Lo and behold, I mean it was hardly a passing. Uh, <laughs> but it wasn't. I mean, I, I hardly heard anybody say anything about it. Okay, yeah, well, now the uh, Department of Defense and uh, the United States has all said, yeah, we, we, we now admit that UFOs, however... But it wasn't really official UFOs, disclosure, though. Well, it's about as official as I think we're probably going to ever get, <laughs> because, I mean, they're admitting that, yeah, they saw a few UFOs, you know, but, and they don't think that they're from, um, you know, here on Earth. Well, <clears throat> the thing about... You know, here's, um, here's the thing, though, uh, <laughs> like when you mentioned UFOs and, and how people would react. And, and, you know, everybody, of course, theorizes about this stuff. And, yeah, you know, the stuff gets put out, you know, through the sources you mentioned. And there was sort of a big yawn. But I think it's a different matter if all of a sudden there's a bunch of ships, you know, floating over cities. And, and everybody is seeing one. I, I think there's sort of a you know, in this day and age, kind of a disconnect with what we see on television or the Internet versus it being right in front of you. Well, yeah, but that's kind of the same thing with Bigfoot. I mean, people that are living in the city, there's a total disconnect with them. And <clears throat> the people that, that live out in the country, well, I mean, yeah, there's some people in the city that have, I guess, they where they've come into, to, uh, you know, close into city locations, but... Uh, I mean, like myself, I mean, I, did, I just don't go around telling anybody and everybody that, you know, what I've seen, because uh, most of them are going to think I'm a nutcase, but, uh, um, I think that's true you know, with most people. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm a novelty in that area, but, uh, um, but on the same token, I, I, I kind of see the same type of response with, Big, but of course now they may be like they are all up in Oklahoma. They may all of a sudden start saying, "Well, we're going to put a, a bounty on their head and <laughs> you know go out and start hunting them." That that so, whole thing was just silliness, you know. isn't it? Well, yeah, it, yes, it was silliness. I think so, but you know, there's a lot of silly people in this world. Will you know that? <laughs> okay, Tom. We're, we're still talking about when if we find one on us and put it on a slab, right? Yeah, that, yeah. Well. I think it's going to be like the California gold rush. I think you're going to get crazy people going out there in the woods, try to get one, and then try to do whatever. Well, here's... Because now you got one. Okay, so here's the thing, though. And I spoke with the person in the Forest Service that was their expert on the Endangered Species Act when I was writing my first book. And as soon as something like that is unknown, becomes officially discovered, nobody can do anything like that. It gets locked down until they have to form a committee of whatever scientists and officials to figure out its habitat, what its needs are, etc. And and it could take many years before they figure all that out. So in the meantime, uh, nobody gets to do anything. And it can even shut logging down and stuff like that. So there wouldn't be a bunch of people running around trying to kill one because they'd be busted for it. Well, yeah. Okay. But <laughs> and good luck trying to do it anyway. Because I yeah. mean look how difficult it is to get to these creatures today. You know, there a bunch of bozos hunting aren't gonna go out and just find one and shoot oh, it. Oh. Okay, Tom. Yeah, you know, that's a good point though, Milo. I think because I've thought about that. And I think that's why well, was it the Scamania County that passed the ordinance oh yeah uh, back in you know, 1969 okay and it wasn't to protect yeah. the creatures it was written that way right. but the actual i i talked i mentioned this before on the show i got to meet roy Kraft, who he was on the skamania county i think he was on the board of commissioners they're the ones that put this together and or at least his name was on the document and he explained to me why they did that. They had a local guy there in Stevenson, Washington, who was sort of a kook. And he would go out and sit in clear cuts by himself. And for an hour or two or three or whatever, he'd sit there. And he would just see Sasquatches appear. 
you know, sometimes a dozen or more in front of him, you know, just out of thin air. So him and some of the locals were going to go out and hunt one. Well, I've been shot at deer hunting. My dad and I were. So, you know, if if somebody's taking a pot shot that is looks like a man and wearing, you know, orange vest and red hat by my, you know, my, you remember the, my, the pickup I had, um, mm-hmm. you know, if they think that's a deer, then something that's vaguely man-shaped, they're going to be shooting at anything, all kind, you know, people and stuff. So that's the reason they enacted that ordinance was to keep these guys from going out shooting at things that look like people. You know, it's already happened. It happened a couple of years ago in Idaho. Oh, yeah. yeah. Some guy got arrested for shooting at another person when they caught him. They said, why were you, you know, why were you shooting at him? He said, oh, I thought he was a Bigfoot. And they said, why did you think it was a Bigfoot? Well, he wasn't wearing a vest. I mean, just oh, a Lord. total crackpot. <clears throat> oh, boy. Well, what about somebody in a ghillie suit? Right, that guy was killed, too. Yeah. Tom, let's move on to the next question. Okay. Um, I, okay, so this is uh, for Forrest. Forrest has said she believes Bigfoot is an ape. Is that different <clears throat> than from Muhammad? Are there any show members familiar with the books and presentations by Lloyd Pye? Do you agree with much of the theory as it relates to Sasquatch? Lloyd Pye? I'm not I'm not familiar with that person now. Does that Will, does that ring a bell with you? I, I knew Lloyd Pye. Um and I'm sitting here trying to remember what his theories were. It's been a while. He's he's been gone a while. Okay, so. he lists them here. Pi believes that Homo erectus. Um, I want to try to pronounce this Neanderthal Neanderthal hats, and other types never died out. <clears throat> In fact, their bipedal uh, walking is better than humans. Okay, and that they aren't ancestors of humans, but they're a fully separate line. <clears throat> Basically, he believes that all Bigfoot types. <laughs> Across the planet are just uh, Miocene hominids that have continued on into modern times. So sort of like some sort of a relic that has just continued on, and we never, you know, haven't officially discovered them. Uh, they live in forest areas, and and human pressure throughout history has simply pushed them further into uh, deeper habitats to avoid humans. So. That's it in a nutshell. Well, well he and I, what are, what are he and I agreed on a lot of things when we chatted. Um, I, I understand what he's saying, and I, and I, I do agree with him overall, I guess, because we, we talk about the different types of Bigfoot, and there's the type four that I think really isn't a Bigfoot creature. It could very well be one of these other relic hominids, like a Neanderthal or something like that. Um I do know from, I read, I think it was that long ago, wasn't it, Forrest? They said that they think there were at least seven other hominids living at the same time as Homo sapien. Yes, and, and I think in the last show, you know, when I brought up the uh, Homo naledi, mm-hmm. <clears throat> uh, they were actually shocked when they got the aging back on those uh, fossils because the one thing they had noticed about the fossils that the fossils had not turned to uh, stone, stone like most of your um, um, Australopithecus uh, and you know early, early. They weren't fossilized. Hominid. And yeah, they 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 were fossilized to a certain degree, but not like in the uh, the others were. So they had noticed that uh, that there was a difference in weight because you get the older ones that uh, have really truly fossilized. They're heavy because they're basically rock. Right. <clears throat> um, but uh, these were not. And when they got the testing back on them and they suddenly were getting a variation from 300,000 to 250,000 years ago, well, what you're looking at is uh, it, it's uh, convergent evolution. It's it's something that actually was having. Here was a, 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 a homo species that was actually exhibiting primitive and some modern features in its morphology, but it was actually, uh, they were thinking, they were actually thinking they were going to get like a 2 million to 3 million year dating on it. And then when it comes back, 
this thing is actually cohabiting with Neanderthal insistence, Cro-Magnon man, uh, the Denisovians, and then that other mystery uh, 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 ancient folk that are <laughs> that we haven't even actually discovered a part of. And I think I told you the only reason they discovered that was because there was a uh, people over in Melanesia that kept showing this ancient uh, ancient thing that was showing up in their DNA, a trait. And so they realized that, oh my gosh, there is another there is another homo species out there because these people that's where these people came from. They're all they all have it. But they just haven't found pieces and parts of this particular homo species yet. And I'm I'm before it's all over with, we're gonna you know, what, people have to realize when they see one one fossil, that is a fossil that rep- may represent thousands of individuals. Yeah, I think I, the, I think I the remember. act of fossilization is so so uh, peculiar and particular that to find multiple individuals like they did this Homo naledi, uh, and these guys are cohabiting with all these other uh, Homo species. So uh, it, it, it's perfectly. Uh, I, I could agree in one respect that there may be Neanderthals still living up in the the Ural Mountains of Russia mm-hmm. or the Caucasus or someplace <laughs> like that. I can I can see it. I can see it happening. And, and there's you know? big there's big so, gaps in the hominid record. So I mean, there could be. They have no idea how many things existed. Oh heavens, no! They don't. They, and and you know, it's probably going to be uh, hundreds of years before we do actually know. Uh, you know, and, and whether we ever do know the the actual uh, you know ladder of evolution for humanity, we we probably never will know exactly how it, oh, it came about. There's no but, way. Uh, yeah. You know. I remember one of my professors so, talking one time about fossilization, and he said that for every fossil you see, that represents one hundred thousand individuals of that species. Exactly. Yes, that is so correct. Yeah. You know, people think, oh, there's just one or two of them running around. No. Oh, no. <laughs> there were thousands of them, you know, and, and, they say and probably variations upon those thousands. So, and they talked you know. about how incredible it was even to get one fossil out of that many. So for people to think that yes. fossils are common, they're really, we have a lot of fossils, true, but they're not really that common because you, you have to have 100,000 individuals before you get one fossil. And, well, and of course the right conditions. I, I had, right, and, and and I had to laugh when and when I, I was watching a program in the University of Wisconsin that he had they had done an extensive uh, uh, study on the Homo naledi, and this guy when he was asking um, uh, for he needed people to uh, do the excavation on these fossils, and of course they're down in these caves and very very difficult to get to. And he put out a, a request, and they had to have an archaeological background, an anthropological background. They had to be spelunkers, and they had to be skinny. And they had to be available within a month. And surprisingly enough, he figured nobody would answer it. Surprisingly enough, he got 57 requests of, to be put on the you know, crew. And out of that, he picked six. And believe it or not, they were all women, very skinny women oh wow so <laughs> yeah <laughs> and if you've ever I, I suggest that people go out there and look that up because it's actually extremely interesting and it really gives you a good idea of how these bipedal apes could very well coexist among a human population and and uh, exactly the way they do and most people not ever be be aware of them well even even things so, like um, the Minnesota Iceman. Uh, that's that's the part of uh, North America where we have what we call the Type Four. They're the slightly smaller creatures. Uh, they don't have hair in their faces. They can actually bald like humans do. And they look more human. They look a little more human, yeah. And um, I, I, my gut says they're not a Bigfoot creature. They're one of these other species. Well, I think you're probably correct on that one. I mean, they they don't seem to fit with the other, you know, morphologies of what people are saying with Bigfoot. There, it's a very different thing. And I have pictures of really good footprints from that part of the country. I, I got some sent to me by some moose hunters who found these tracks way up in the middle of nowhere, and they're not 
they're not really any different size than a normal human adult. They're probably uh, in the range of, you know, 11, 12 inches long and uh, very, very human looking. Hmm. I'll have to send those to you sometime. I don't think I've showed you those. Yeah, yeah, do that. Well, I mean, and, and there is a historical account in Russia, and I think maybe I'd mentioned this before, where they actually, uh, uh, some Russians, this is back in the early history of Russia, uh, that the Red Army thought that there was uh, terrorists or rebels hiding out in this cave, and when they actually uh, shot up this cave, they, they actually killed this, caveman and and some people think that what they actually killed was a, a neanderthal type person oh that's interesting because the way they described it that's exactly what it that's exactly what it looked like i mean i think i think personally i i mean if you've seen some of the the more modern renditions of the um uh neanderthal skulls and such uh they all didn't look like you know cavemen that drug their women around by their hair and, and no. carried big uh, <laughs> clubs and stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, I hate to say this, but they looked like a lot of Eastern European people. And I think that under the normal circumstances that if you clean them up and put them in a suit, you probably wouldn't pay any attention to them walking down the street. Yeah, that's very possible. Seriously. You know, and... Uh, well, you know, and, uh, and that region is so vast. I don't think people understand just how big... I remember when, after the collapse of the Soviet Union back in the 90s, they had, um, I think it was Weyerhaeuser, had gotten some timber contracts in Siberia. And at the time, I was thinking, oh, that might be interesting to go do something like that. And they were showing this map. And they had three, there were three proposed cuts. And the cuts were the size of states like New Hampshire. They were huge. But they were just tiny when, when you looked at the overall map. And I, I thought two two problems with that was there were, uh, you know, the remoteness, because there were no roads or anything to these timber cuts they were proposing. And there were also tigers in that area. And I thought, eh, I, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, Siberian tigers. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> <laughs> that kind of put a damper in my enthusiasm to that idea. Well, there's still that <laughs> I mean, there's still just huge, vast expanses of wilderness in Russia and Siberia and even China, for that oh, matter. Oh, absolutely, that, uh, yeah. You know, that <laughs> heavens knows what's out there. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, they're, study, they, they are in discovering new species our of Our national forests and stuff. Oh, yeah. You know. You know I mean, what? I think there's a lot of things out there we don't know about. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I would say so. I mean. I second that. Let's see, where is Tom? Is Tom back? He went to step away from Tom's there. Oh, no, no. There Tom's is. here. I'm just listening. Okay. <laughs> okay. But actually, this next we question really point. kind of... <laughs> well, that too, but... Um, so this kind of dovetails into your your conversation here. <clears throat> is there good evidence that Bigfoot exists in continental Europe? And he says he's excluding Russia or Scandinavia. Um but just, and I think, well, we've heard stories from Eastern Europe. Oh, I just wonder what I your have, thoughts. I have a guy who contacted me a few years back, and he was, and Michael, I'm sorry if you're listening. If I botch this, I haven't, don't have it in front of me, but I think he was in um, what used to be the area of Yugoslavia. I, I'm probably wrong that, but he was in Eastern Europe and actually got chased out of the woods by one of these creatures. I should pull that up and look at it real quick so I can quote it. Go ahead and talk for a second, guys, and I'll see if I can find yeah, it. Yeah, I was going to say, because this guy's talking about the Alps, the Pyrenees, and the Carpathian Mountain, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Carpathian Mountain, does that mountain range extend into Yugoslavia? But I'd have to look at that. Okay. No, you're not asking me. <laughs> I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read well, this. Well, I am asking you. I, I'm going to read this. This was... <laughs> well, I don't know. I... <laughs> hey, guys. Geography. <laughs> this is... I, I'm going to read this. The email he sent Well, that's me. like Croatia um, and all that now. Hey, hey, guys. 
Give me a second, will you? I'm going to read this. Yeah. This is the story from Michael Kilcourse, is his name. He says, Hi, William. I was glad to hear back from you as soon as I knew a man like yourself was very busy. Let me start by saying this experience occurred and I had no knowledge of the Sasquatch. Subject had to be... Um, Oh, he says, subject, and to be honest, I didn't believe during the early 2000s up to 2008 we experienced an economic boom here in Ireland, especially Dublin, which gave me or gave way to a lot of Eastern European workers filling many jobs, uh, as there were so many to fill in my industry, which was steel erecting. Anyhow, during these years, I got very friendly with two guys called, uh, and I'm going to probably botch this, it's R A D O, Rado, Rado, and Brian from Slovakia. As years passed working side by side, we taught each other uh, all the bad slang words in our own languages. Anyway, to get to the point, I was in, I was invited over to Slovakia a number of times. As I was told, it was very beautiful. They had great outdoors, which and I was told they had wolves, bear, large deer, etc. I loved to hike and did a little hunting, as I do here in pheasant season. So I traveled over with uh, Rado in June 2006 for his sister's wedding. I arrived at the town. They lived about 150 miles west of the airport and realized it was more of a village rather than a town, which disappointed me in the woman department. <laughs> Sorry, he was putting some personal stuff in here. Uh, he says, on the other hand, the scenery was stunning. Heavily forested mountains, lakes, etc. We met his family and hit the nearest pub for a catch-up with Rado's family. Uh, he says he couldn't understand a word. He says, all night, but enjoyed the wheat beer. And he was talking about, you know, how much he was... Uh, spending time with the family so he says at the end of the village there was a small um let's see he said his family sorry about that i have to back up a little bit he said he was always up at 7 a.m the rest of the family was sleeping so he decided he was going to go for a hike he said there's a small trail that led off into the forest so i decided to walk a little and see what birds i could spot if any but i could hear the forest was waking so uh, the morning sounds were refreshing to hear. He says, I'd walked about 15 minutes or so in the small dirt track that wound through uh, the uphill steep climb. Then I realized how quiet it was compared to when I had first started. There were no birds, insects, nothing. He said, I started to worry in case it got lost, so I quickly spun around and started to make, way, make my way back when I noticed something bipedal was walking in unison with me. But inside the, inside the thick tree line, sorry, I'm stumbling over myself, folks, I stopped and it would stop. I yelled a few choice words. The guys taught me in Slovak. Um, he says and carried on. Every step was copied nearly stride for stride. I stopped again and it stopped again. This time the tree line was kind of thinner so I could make out a big black outline. Seven foot or so. Seven foot or so in the underbrush so uh, no features. I didn't need any more hanging around and took off like a scalded cat. I could hear my heart beating my chest. To my horror, this thing was also running. I could see down the hill, exit out onto the cobble road that led to the village, about 200 meters away. Then I noticed the heavy footfall had stopped. I looked around uh, while still running. So he said apparently once he came out into this opening, the creature stopped. Uh, but he said uh, it was about 75 feet away from him. I would say it was 7 feet tall, but it could have been bigger. Um... He just he wasn't really sure. He said it was built like a huge weightlifter uh, from the side, a huge physique, hair, but not really thick. And um, so that was kind of that. Sorry for the stumbling around there in my words, folks. I am not a real good at reading things. Um, but that was his story. That's a direct witness account. When did he say this? This was two thousand six. Post two thousand six. Two thousand six. Okay. Well, wasn't there the what the the nine? Um, and I'm trying. Oh heavens! I'm trying to think of uh, <clears throat> where they were. The nine Russian hikers that uh, were trying to get their. Uh, they were working on getting their licenses, licensing, and. Uh, hiking so that they could lead tours and such um, and they were all killed up there on that mountain they actually had a photo that they had taken of uh, one but there were some Do you remember that yeah there, there was there were some strange I remember reading that 
story years ago before it before it turned into a Bigfoot story. It was actually a UFO account before that because there were some. Well, yeah, oh yeah, they, yeah. Well, no, I'm just saying they had uh, they had some. They point did have in their, a photograph. Yeah. Travels, they had actually taken. They did take a a photo of one. Right, they did. Uh, yeah, and then uh, then there's there's been several uh, ideas of, as to what actually transpired up there on that mountain and it, you know because it of where you know where it happened i don't think anybody ever is going to know the truth uh truth about that situation but uh i mean there's there's pictures and and such as that all all over uh all over uh tom the carpathian mountains uh are a 1500 mile range that stretch from central to eastern europe on an east and western range from uh uh, see the Czech Republic all the way down to Romania. Yeah, so they do. I think there's a little bit of them that pokes into Yugoslavia on the eastern eastern side. Yeah, but I have they're, a they're incredible I have an mountains. Explanation. I need to ask her if she's ever heard any stories. Absolutely. So. Um, I think we've tackled that one as best we can, um, <clears throat> especially with that latest encounter. Okay, so he says, hello all. This is our next next uh, question here. I've heard reports of Bigfoot walking and running both upright and on all fours. Do you know if they're faster um, in one mode or the other, either upright or on all fours? Does this tendency differ with subspecies or with age? Uh, maybe the type 1 paddy types are mostly upright, <clears throat> while the type 3 and type 4s are, you know, may, maybe more comfortable on four limbs for speed. Uh, can they sprint upright? Well, okay. What are your thoughts? You're, you're talking, there, there's a, a number of things, there are a number of questions. So, um, okay, let's look at a couple of variants. There's the one you see in the Patterson film. That one's very, the muscles are very bulky, and that one is very powerfully built. That one is built for, or adapted to very mountainous terrain. That's why the muscles are so bulky. And when you go east of the mountains, where it flattens out into the plains, along, like, east of the Cascades, east of the Siskiyous, all that region, uh, the creatures are more slender. So they've adapted to open country running. So that's a difference. Um, the type twos, the ones, you know, we talk about the two major groupings, the ones that have the blocky teeth, like the Patterson film creature. Uh, then there's the ones in the south, predominantly the type twos, that have the large canines. Th they seem to be um, as often on all fours as they are upright. So they seem to be a little more comfortable on all fours. That's that's what we know. We don't know much about the type threes and the like. So the type fours, that I think that's something completely different. You know that brought up some weird stuff because when I was in Kosovo, there the, there was parts of the UN and stuff that would really freak out if we went over a couple of different territories or borders, and they they would say stay out of there. Yeah, that's hard telling. I mean, they they may knew things that. They weren't going to tell you. Tom, I know we got a lot of questions, so let's go ahead and keep moving through those. Okay. By the way, I want to thank everybody. You guys are bringing in some excellent questions. You're keeping the topic alive and interesting. And you, your question, <clears throat> excuse me, are the same questions that many people have. So, anyway, we just want to thank you for that. Okay. Um, so... All right, so talking about on all the fours and all that sort of thing. Um, what animals have been confirmed that Bigfoot mimics well? And I think we know, we know that we know that we know that they do owls. And, and crows. Owls and crows. And crows, yeah. <laughs> okay, what experiences do hunters and others have regarding this? Okay, what do you think Bigfoot uses these calls for? Are they trying to attract prey, or do you think they're communicating be between themselves, or maybe a combination? No, I think they're communicating between themselves. They're not. You're not going to call it a crow or an, or an owl and get it to come to you. Okay. Not when they can so, ambush a deer and get more, you know, result from that action. Well, 
all right, can you attract a Bigfoot? If you were, if we were to do this kind of call, and I think in terms of Gerald up in Washington, where he was doing, uh, <clears throat> you know, a female elk call just before sunset. You know, I wonder though, if if it was, you know, I don't think they were that easily fooled by a man-made call. I wonder if they knew that was a human. You know what I mean? And and just because they made... Yeah, yeah, right. Because remember, he said they made a variety of sounds. It wasn't just one sound. It was... That's what threw him off at first. There were different sounds the creatures were making from different locations around him. So I thought yeah, about... that's right. I thought about that for... Ever since we talked to him about that. I, I don't it was think... a terrifying experience regardless. Yeah, I, I just don't... I have a hard time thinking that they're going to be fooled by <laughs> some sound that people are going to make and come in that way. If if you Okay, so let me let me play devil's advocate on that. Why do you think they wouldn't be fooled? What what is it that they have what abilities that they have that if you can call an elk in with a good elk, you know, if you're talented at that with the right equipment, why what would be different about the Bigfoot? Well, you got an elk that's not really that intelligent. As opposed to as opposed to a Sasquatch that's highly intelligent and very very aware of all the animals in its environment and what they sound like. And on top of that, they he could have been under observation as well. And he probably was, because he was surrounded. Remember. Right, right. Which is not a good thing. Not a good thing. <laughs> um, well, you're okay. dealing with an animal that's highly in- intelligent first and a highly intelligent animal that's totally reactive to its uh, environment and uh, we're not and they are so uh, they could I think very quickly make a distinction you know and whether it was human made or whether it was actually coming from a real elk yeah I, so, I think they pick it up pretty quick are we thinking or is this more like a, a guy trying to mimic a Bigfoot mimicking a elk or no he is was just something where a man is trying to mimic an elk to lure in a big no no gerald was hunting elk and he was in a tree stand <clears throat> and he and he got tired of no activity so he used his elk call then he started hearing okay. these weird sounds and and apparently the creatures were coordinating vocally with one another and he decided you know the sounds didn't didn't add up to him it, like they should uh, they weren't supposed to be there, the kind of sounds that we're making. And he got out of the tree stand, he was making his way to his truck to get out of there, and then pretty soon mm-hmm. the creatures were on him from all <clears throat> directions. Wow. Yeah, he was pretty frightened, and the guy's an ex-cop, so, you know, he, he was he was pretty scared. Okay. That, that, that it kind of brings it more to light to what it, talking about to me anyway that that sound that's crazy yeah it was it was there was nothing bigfoot related at all it just uh, you know in his actions he was he Mm. was hunting he was trying to get the elk to to move and and he got something he didn't want yeah and he had good sense to listen to that well he that's what's impressive he and i had just talked a few days before that Uh and and i told him i said well, I was giving him different methods to do in case he was, you know, in a situation kind of like that. I mean, we didn't predict that exact situation, but, you know, in a situation where he needed an escape. So I said, one of the things you do is you, if you're alone, they don't know you're alone. And actually, he wasn't, he didn't go there alone. He had two partners, hunting partners, and they had actually moved away without him knowing it to a different spot. Um so they weren't close by, but the creatures didn't know that. So I said, what you want to do is you want to talk out loud like you're talking to other people. And it's what saved his bacon. He was able to get to his truck. Tom, I don't now, Oh, go ahead. Okay, this same person, he wants to know, he says it was also mentioned a few months back that some hunters were able to observe Sasquatch undetected for many hours. What did they learn, and have you ever heard, ever had them on to discuss it? 
was that? That wasn't Roy and his father, was it? I don't know. I was just trying to think. I I was trying to think that too. I'm trying to think. Yeah. So if you're listening to the show and you hear this question, maybe, and you know which episode it is, yeah, we'd love to you know, take a look at that for you. Okay. What else do we have? All right. All right. Greetings, everyone, and we really enjoy the weekly show. What type of Sasquatch are you dealing with in your research and tracking? Can you tell which types you're dealing with by the signs they lead, footprints, and other behavior? And any idea the relative population size of each group, uh, which is largest and where? Well, <laughs> okay. Um as far as the types were that I'd say Tom were probably dealing with the Patterson type Sasquatch in that area. Once. Number one, yeah. it's the, the location because it's really not all that far from where those creatures were, uh, geographically and group sizes vary from area to area. So, um, and sometimes they'll, the different groups will bond together temporarily. So it's really difficult to give, uh, you know, you know what's the largest group size? The largest one I ever heard of was, I think, 40, 45 individuals. That wasn't a single group. That was a number of groups that had joined together temporarily. But um, because a typical group is four to six individuals, although the area we're working, you know, there are about 15 in that group. And, Tom, we still don't know if that's a single group or if that's a couple of groups together. Yeah, we don't. No. Uh, but they did group around us. They did. They did. At least at least <laughs> a five of them or so. Yes. The ones we could hear anyway. So they were probably the scouts. Who knows? Yeah, right. Um, they were checking us out. As long as they weren't the Mater D's, so. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> um, okay. Any evidence that Sasquatch will steal human items? and use them i don't know about you well okay use would be in that category they do take things they're kind of kleptos um but the usage they won't use them for the item that they are let's say you know if they steal a flashlight they're not going to use it as a flashlight they would use it as a baiting item i'll just comment on that i am so glad to the best of my knowledge in our knowledge, I don't think they've figured out how to use rifles yet. You're right. We don't want them to. <laughs> oh, no. Um, okay, so any evidence that they use or wear clothes, human clothes? No. And I can't imagine how they would do that. Well, I mean, sheer size alone. Um, I, I know from the, the first one I ran into, the thing was enormous. There is, I, I can't even think... You would have to have special made clothes for something like that. You wouldn't just, you know, find something or take something off somebody and use it. There's just no way. And they don't have any yeah, need for absolutely. that anyway. So. Well, and the proportions are probably going to be all wrong. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, arm length and even even a juvenile. I can't imagine like a real small one trying to put on human clothes. I just, you know, I can't imagine that working. No, I don't. Hat? I don't know. Maybe they could put a hat. They just, you know, they just wouldn't. I'm sure they they know what those clothing items are for because they, they see us wearing them. But um, Well, I guess the obvious question would be, you know, other primates. You know, would they take human clothing and put it on? Have you ever heard anything like that, Forrest? I mean, people dress chimps, but that's different. <laughs> Well, actually, I have seen uh, chimpanzees and even little macaques that are in a pet situation where they, they dress them all the time. They will actually bring the clothes to the uh, uh, their owners, and um, I have actually watched a, a chimp. He was doing a pretty good job putting his own clothes on. Um, but it's not something they do know, in the wild, and though, right? Macaques, macaques will, will do it. They don't always get it get it on correctly and then they kind of look at mom or dad like can you help me out here please <laughs> uh but i mean they're so used to being dressed that they just think that that's the way they have to be you know but it's not something but, you'd expect um, in the wild yeah, though, right? well, you know in a pet situation yes I, I don't know about in the wild why they'd even want to 
you know, attempt to put somebody's clothes on. Yeah, because they're adapted to their surroundings. I mean, we put clothing on because we're not. Okay, Tom, what do, what do we got? All right. It says, hello, gentlemen. Uh, Missy from Ohio here. I'm worried about forest. I doubt you have an answer to this question, but here it goes just the same. I'm wondering what the creatures take into consideration when they decide what to do about humans. In particular, chase this one away or make a meal of another one. Uh, most opinions I hold on this subject I form from listening to your show. I believe that some encounters take place with the intention of running people off, but I wonder if there might be anything in particular that make them decide to go ahead and turn somebody into the proverbial ham sandwich. The slow one. Hmm. Are are you asking me that question? (laughs) Well, it's, I'm throwing it out there. She's throwing it out to everybody. But she does. I know. Missy <laughs> says she does and, have and, some concern for you. So. Well, and I and uh, you know, Tom, you and I have actually talked about this, and uh, I've changed my whole uh, manner of um, things of what I do around here. You know, I don't go out in the dark anymore. Um, I'm I'm in the house, and I'm lock the door now that who's to say you know they they forced their way into a cabin once before who's to say and i trust me that thought has gone uh, through my mind several times at what point in time will somebody decide to get brave enough to just come on in the uh you know house too so um i mean that's (laughs) that's a question i really don't know the answer to and um i'm hoping that maybe there'll be someday a resolution to that I'll just well, leave you've got it a three fifty seven. You got a thirty out six. Got you a, got a shotgun. I got a three fifty seven. Yeah, I got a thirty out six. But you know, I you know, I've talked about this before too. I think that with the the muscle uh, density structure and all that sort of stuff, I'd have to, I have to, I'm going to have to have a well placed head shot. So, right. And if if <laughs> I do manage to take one down, I know two gentlemen I will be placing a call to immediately. <laughs> And, and and my bet as well. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll take care of it first. <laughs> I was going to ask you: okay. Did you get the air infrared beacons? Yes, I did. I, and I meant to say something to you earlier about that, and I completely forgot. I apologize. Oh no problem. I, I hope <laughs> I hope they uh, have some positive results. Yes, I, I've got to sit down and and uh, uh, figure out. The, the, how to use them, and then I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna start carrying one. It. <laughs> oh, it's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, where are we at, Tom? All right. Um, so she just goes on. She she's got a little bit of a comment here. She says, "My mother and sister lived together in a small town further up the river in Marietta. So that sounds like maybe Georgia." Um. Okay, I'm just going through here. The situation makes me think of Forrest uh, watching Bigfoot. Um, okay, so it sounds like she's uh, she's empathetic towards Forrest. And um, so appreciate it. Thank you, Missy. Um, my, okay, she has full, full, she's given us full permission to share this experience. So we're going to get a hold of her regarding this. Sounds like she has a, uh, an encounter from the Wayne National Forest. And uh, so we'll get a hold of you. Thank you, Missy. One question. I want to kind of back up a little bit, guys. And we've talked about this in the past, but it, I think it, it, it's, you know, we're going to have new listeners and it, it, uh, I think it's worthwhile going over real quick. Talking about the, uh, the conditions that are required to create fossils and why fossils are so rare. Can Forrest, can you comment on that and will maybe uh, dovetail in? Well, <clears throat> what creates a fossil? They've got to be in a perfect situation where the, the, the bone can be protected long enough that the bone can uh, basically, uh, what is happening is the bone is replaced by rock. Uh, mineralization occurs, um, and uh, I will be honest with you, I don't know the 
all the particulars that uh, and and creating a fossil, uh, but uh, it obviously takes a long, long time. Um, we're we always are amazed at some of the things that do survive uh, millions of years, um, <clears throat> even down to what was it that T Rex that actually had tissue in it mm-hmm. uh, that has survived literally millions of years. So um, and. And the fact that we are being able to extract DNA from uh, uh, the Denisovian bones that we found, the the Neanderthal bones that we found, and Cro-Magnon and all that, and be able to trace it into the human population that we have now, I think I find that utterly utterly amazing. And like these Homo naledi bones, they have been sent out for that too to uh, see if there's actually any type of interbreeding that's occurred, anything that's possibly passed down into the human population today. Um, You know, it it takes millions of years to accomplish this. That's why the Homo naledi bones were not completely fossilized like what you find in your Australopithecus and uh, even your uh, Homo habilis and Homo erectus where they literally turn to rock. And um, it, it is such special conditions. And I don't even think people that, that do fossils all the time, these, these uh, paleoanthropologists, I don't, and even uh, uh, paleontologists that do dinosaurs and stuff, I don't think anybody actually knows the whole technique uh, that occurs when fossilization occurs. It's, it's, it's almost like a magical thing that happens that turns these bones. And they have to be in such... Special conditions. That's why why they're so rare. Yeah, I, I we covered this some of this in my coursework. They, um, uh, it's it, there's basically two main conditions, and the first condition. Well, not, let me back up a little bit. The main thing that needs to be um, present or not present actually in the creation of a fossil is oxygen has to be removed because oxygen is one of the most corrosive agents there is in the world. Um, well, and it feeds bacteria too. Right. So that's what happens. That's what happens to something that's dead. You know, the oxygen it corrodes it quickly. So either th- either an animal that's been buried very quickly, let's say you know in pumice or in a mudslide or something like that, where it's covered, it's protected, and there's no oxygen getting to it. The other condition is if it falls, let's say, in a lake. Um, and it's covered by mud because it, it, the oxygen is removed as soon as it's under the water. So that's why things like boats. There's I remember when I was at uh, Fort Benning, outside of Fort Benning in uh, Columbus, Georgia, they have a um, Civil War Naval Museum, and they dredge up all of these Civil War era boats, military boats, uh, that would burn down to the water level, and then they would sink because, and you know, then what was left under the water after you know a couple hundred years can be dredged up and and it's still in pretty good shape but things sink and and then over time they get covered by mud so that's where fossilization can occur there too but uh, removing oxygen and it is a very long process because the cells are replaced individually by minerals so it's sort of a trade you know one for one until the whole thing is turned to stone well, and it always doesn't even occur like that, and that's the reason that you see these uh, uh, paleo uh, paleoanthropologists and paleontologists that they'll you know, they're, they'll be putting these uh, 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 solutions on them to hold the bones together because not all the time every cell is replaced like right. that. So you have uh, bone breakage, and and uh, and plus a lot of times you know the fact that you've got so much earth, uh, you know. De- being deposited on top of these remains that you, you get a compression they of the bones crushed, so yeah. then the bones crushed and they crack and so they've got to be treated before they need to be brought out and a lot of times you'll see them actually take them out and whole pieces of stone and then they're taken back to the lab and they use dental tools oh, to yeah. uh, work on those things. Yeah. I mean it takes it, 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 you can, that's why you never hear, you know, you'll find out that, oh, well, yeah, they discovered this or that and the other, but you won't hear about it for 10, 20 years because it probably took them that long to get the darn thing out of the rock. Absolutely. So, and the, uh, and the two worst conditions for fossilization are jungle conditions 
and the kind of forests we have in exactly. North America. So because they're aesthetic, right? So where does the Sasquatch live? In one of the worst places where fossils well, could happen. Well, and that kind of brings up another question that we can't we can't really answer, but we can certainly ask. It's interesting to you know, think about, and that is. Um, what what happens to the dead Sasquatch? Do they just leave them out there like a wild animal, or do they have some kind of a culture and that you know rituals where they maybe buried their dead? I've read stories that say both. There were stories of people finding dead ones. I can think of a couple off the top of my head who were just there rotting away. Uh, and there was another one where people saw a group of them around a dead one they'd placed on a rock. So. Your guess is as good as mine on that one. Uh, be, that would be interesting um, from a far, far distance. <laughs> well, there's actually Indian Indian cultures in uh, uh, eastern the eastern portion of Oklahoma where they have found some mounds that the Indians swear up and down that those mounds are graves of Bigfoot, that they are not Indian mounds, that they are mounds that were used to bury the dead of uh, Bigfoot. So, I, I could tell you um, a story. Believe it or not, I don't know of, any, don't know of anybody that has uh, uh, excavated any of them. So. Well, I, could, I could tell you a story about something like that I personally experienced. Um, this was back in the late 80s. It was in Skamania County. There was the old-timer named Datus Perry that, you know, he was most of the time pretty much worthless for information. And I know there's still people today who think he was a, a great Bigfoot research. He was a crackpot. I knew Datus for a long time. Uh, anyway, you know, nice old guy, but he was a crackpot. But he called us one time, you know, we were thinking, okay, another wild goose chase, but we would go on the off chance that he, we got, there were a couple times he took us out and we did find something, but it wasn't from his information. It was something that inadvertently led to finding something. But anyway, uh, he took us to this place. He used to do a lot of exploring in Skamania County with the lava tubes there. And uh, so he knew where a lot of those were, and he showed us many of them. And this one site, we he drove us to, and we had to get out and walk cross-country to it. And when we got there, there were nine of these mounds of rocks. And, and I can't remember how. They were probably, you know, 10, 12 feet across, 5 feet or high or so. And the rocks were probably, um, on average, about cantaloupe size so i took pictures and and i i talked to one of my uh native friends from the klamath tribe and he and uh, he said well he ended up contacting people from um indians in that area and they said that uh those did not belong to their tribe their people didn't do that <laughs> so we speculated that these were probably uh, Sasquatch burial sites and my friend Carlo and I went there one day because uh, I was trained in archaeology my first couple of years of college and my thinking was I wanted to excavate these to see what was there and, and he was a sociologist so <laughs> you know here I am the nuts and bolts guy I'm, I'm on my knees moving these rocks out of the way trying to uncover it and he was talking the whole time about and I wasn't paying any attention. He says, oh, you probably shouldn't disrespect the native peoples and blah, blah, blah. And he was putting the rocks back. And I wasn't paying any attention to what he was doing. And I kept thinking, after a while, I'm sweating. I'm thinking, God, I'm not making any progress. How come? And then I see what he's doing. <laughs> and I just, I gave up because he was such a nice guy. And I thought, okay, I don't want to, I'll come back another time. But I never made it back there. But um, John, our forensic anthropologist, and I talked about that. He says, well... Uh, and and they were, there was a lot of moss growing on the rocks. So they were old. They'd been there a long time, and um, and they weren't under trees. They were out in the open. So you know, for moss to grow in a situation like that, they had to have been there a long time. But John said, well, one of the problems with recovering any biological material from a burial site like that is number one, uh, they're very those rocks would be very porous. So you would have not only microbes but rodents and insects and all kinds of things, you know, not to mention weather conditions that would erode the bones away fairly quickly. So uh, I never I never did try to go back there and excavate any of those. 
you know, there's an interesting thought, and that is that, uh, you know, we've heard a lot of stories that seem credible that Sasquatch actually will take human remains, preserve them somehow. They'll keep them. You know, there's that pilot that went down outside mm-hmm. of Crater Lake, and 30, 32 years later, some hikers found his skull just sitting in pristine condition like it came out of a store or lab or something sitting on I think on a log and you got to wonder how how do they do that you know how do they well, keep it from yeah the first, first place it was preserved out of the weather out of the elements and then secondly it was placed in a position where people would find it right very peculiar that, Oh, well, that's like the uh, skull that I, it was a deer, deer skull, but it, had, it was like a six point, mm-hmm. perfectly preserved, just sitting out there. There was no, there's no hide, no remains, no other bones. And trust me, uh, Will, I'm going to take you to that place someday. You'll see there's not even a path to get there. There was, <clears throat> this was not some place where a person just left this thing behind. Right, Absolutely. Well, I have visions of pre- the movie Predator when you when you talk about stuff like that. I don't want that vision. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. When he li- he literally was lovingly stroking the skulls of the, the men that he had <laughs> killed. Oh, I was like, right. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're like trophies yeah. or something. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And and you know and I think I, uh, if y'all remember me telling you about the time that we. I came out there and I found a a, a, a whole deer side of a a deer horn and it was uh, actually part of the skull cap was still attached. It was just sitting out there, um, in my pathway and it hadn't been there before and uh, it hadn't been chewed on or anything. It was just perfectly intact and then just a portion of that that skull cap right there on there and I was like, okay, where did oh, this no. come from? <laughs> now that's interesting. I, I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, I, I yeah I had told I think I told you guys a long long time ago about that. That was that was really kind of bizarre. I mean, well, I, I was just like, where did this come from? <laughs> wow. You know. Well, we're running a little short of time. We'll have to revisit that uh, maybe next week. But um, we let's go around. I guess Tom, we'll see if we get any final thoughts or anything. No, I just want to. I really want to thank our audience. You guys are fantastic. You are sending some excellent questions, and keep them coming. Uh, you keep the topic alive, and they're very interesting. So thank you very much. Milo? Oh, those were great questions. I really enjoyed it. Forrest, any final thoughts or anything? Uh, no, there were some great questions. Uh, I'd, I'd like at some point in time to one of the ladies, uh, I believe it was a lady that had a question about uh, quadrupedal running versus bipedal running and uh, at some point in time maybe in another show i'd like to um extensively address that <laughs> i didn't want to get into it uh this time so uh but uh yeah because i have some interesting thoughts on that too so um well, we do have a couple minutes if you wanted to talk about it well i think it, i think the if i remember the, the gist of the question was um whether they could run faster quadrupedally or bipedally. Um, <clears throat> most of your apes, gorillas, chimpanzees, um, gibbons, um, can actually, uh, of course, gibbons have a kind of a strange way of traveling anyway. There is this kind of in between quadrupedal and, and uh, uh, bipedalism, and it has to do with the, the, the enormous length of their uh, arms and stuff because they're true brachiators. But most of your gorillas and chimps actually run faster well they are much faster quadrupedally than they are bipedally and it has to do with the the you know the humoral uh uh, femoral index uh and that's the ratio of the humerus to the uh length of humerus to the the uh femoral on a on a primate in other words they're longer in their arms than they are in their their legs so they had they are definitely much faster quadrupedally so therefore a bigfoot in that situation you do hear about a lot of bigfoot that have enormously long arms i would think that they probably would be faster quadrupedally than they would be bipedally however 
The one thing that I have always noticed about Bigfoot, and you don't find in uh, uh, your apes and monkeys, they have no butt. Primates have no butt. Um, we have a butt. And baby, Bigfoot's got back. And um, so it is strange and as funny as that may sound, that makes all the difference in the fact that we can run long distances bipedally, we can walk long distances bipedally, and it does not bother us. We could never get down and walk quadrupedally like the apes and the chimpanzees do, which they can travel much faster quadrupedally than they can bipedally because they don't have that, that uh, glute structure back there. Bigfoot does. I mean, every picture that I've never seen of them, they got, they got a butt, and just like us. So that makes them unique. And for that reason alone, I think uh, there are those that are much faster and probably more so than us uh, bipedally. And, I mean, don't we hear that all the time about how fast they can run uh, on their feet? Yeah, we actually we actually know someone who clocked one at 45 miles an hour. Yeah, well, that's as fast as a thoroughbred horse runs. So, very interesting. Well, with that, folks, we'll leave this segment. And uh, thanks, everyone. Stay tuned for the next segment, folks. In Bigfoot history. Sister Lakes, Michigan, June 1964. True, June 1966 and other publications report a dozen people seeing a 9-foot, 500-pound thing that cries like a baby and makes the earth tremble when it walks. It looks like an ape and its eyes shown in the dark. Several people said they had seen such a creature earlier on occasion. Police found human-like footprints 6 inches wide across the ball and 4 inches across the heel. All sightings were at night except one by girls aged 12 and 13 who were frightened on a wooded road by something like a bear on its hind legs except for the face. Welcome. This is a five-story collection being brought to you by William Jevning and being narrated by me, Jim Sower. Story number one, The Creature from the Avalanche. What did Tony Woolridge see and photograph standing in the melting snow on a Himalayan mountainside? Was it, at last, a yeti? Woolridge himself thinks so. He told his story to David Helton, who reports herein, and showed his pictures to two experts, who deliver their contrasting judgments. BBC Wildlife Magazine, September 1986. When in early March of this year, Tony Woolridge first saw fresh animal tracks on the slopes of the snow on either side of him, the thought of a yeti did briefly cross his mind, but only as a funny idea. He was, of course, in the same general part of the western Himalayas where, in 1937, H. W. Tillman followed a set of large, ape-like footprints for more than a mile, and where, in 1976, Peter Boardman and Joe Tasker emerged from their tent on a morning after a night disturbed by unidentifiable low growls to discover that whatever the thing was that had kept them awake, it had apparently, and this may have been what the growling was about, scoffed 36 Mars bars, complete with wrappers, before wandering off ahead of a wake of tracks very much, like the ones Tillman had found. Other mountaineers had also had food go missing in this neighborhood, and Woolridge, who was the first person to have passed through this valley since the autumn snows, was vaguely aware of such stories. Nevertheless, if there is anything that always happens to someone else, it is an encounter with a legendary animal and after a quick smile at the Yeti idea, Woolridge forgot it. There are lots of interesting sights to be seen in these mountains, and the last thing you need to do up here, especially if you are alone, is to fantasize. 
unlike most Westerners who come to the Himalayas, Woolridge was not a trekker, or a tourist, or a climber. He was there as a charity fundraiser. In ordinary life, he is a physicist who does research and development for the CEGB in Manchester, United Kingdom, and he has been on walking and climbing trips to the Alps and the Andes, but on this occasion he was on a 200-mile sponsored solo run for an organization called Tradecraft, which promotes trade, intermediate technology, and fair play and conditions in third world countries, including India. He was staying mainly in the 1,800 meter high town of Joshamath, northeast of Delhi, and not far from the Tibetan and Nepalese borders, and was ranging out from there in different directions through the high valleys over a day or two or three days. Each day he would set himself a goal and try to run to it in time to run back either to Joshamath or to another outlying base before nightfall. It was eleven o'clock on the morning of the fifth day out when he saw the footprints. He had run from Govingat, the village north of Joshamath, to a couple of empty bungalows known as Ganjaria, and was now trying to reach the closed end of the highest valley he had gone through so far, about 4,000 meters. At 3,300 meters he saw the footprints, and was struck by their clarity, smiled at the idea of a yeti, and, and then wondered what really might have left them. I thought it was probably some sort of large langur monkey, because there were a lot of them about, lower down, between Govindgat and Ganjaria, there were a lot of colonies of them, and I do remember reassuring myself that it didn't look like a big cat. Snow leopards are the only thing I had been told were in the area. But, of course, a person could spend a good part of his life actively searching for and never even glimpsing a snow leopard. Peter Mathiasen wrote a very good book, Snow Leopard about his and George Schaller's Himalayan snow leopard expedition, during which, almost incidentally, they failed to get a single reliable sighting. To be afraid of an attack by a snow leopard, even granting that you could believe that such an animal would ever consider tangling with a man, would be impossible. If only because anybody who was ever killed by one would almost certainly go straight to paradise. A bear? I was under the impression that there weren't any bears around here. Anyway, there weren't any claws in the prints. He had also seen a wildlife notice earlier, the whole region is a national park, and it hadn't mentioned bears. In fact, there probably are bears in the area. Asian black bears are reckoned to range throughout the Himalayas, and brown bears are also occasionally reported. But the footprints did not look like a bear's, and that was that. They did not have paw-like symmetry. He could tell that much, even though he did not stand around for a long time gazing at them. He considered a few more possibilities, but nothing seemed quite right. From a medium distance, he took a couple of pictures. I had a long way to go to get up to where I had to get back down that day, so... I didn't hang about too long. My main concern was with the instability of the snow, because it was so warm that day, and the surface was rapidly getting softer. I realized that the longer I left it, the harder work it was going to be. The next thing that happened, as he half ran, half plodded onward through the wet snow, was that a bird of prey with a six-foot wingspan came in very low, and took a particular interest in him. Woolridge is not a naturalist, and had no idea what kind of bird it was, although, having looked at a field guide since then, he thinks it might have been a griffin vulture. But what had begun as a fascinating close look at a large specimen of mountain avifauna gradually changed character as the bird continued to spiral down at him. I thought... Does it think I'm injured or something? I was obviously going very slowly over the open slopes, and although I had an ice axe with me, 
I just couldn't afford to take the risk that it might harm me in some way. So, finally, I shouted at it, and fortunately it disappeared off to the other side of the hillside. If it seems odd that anyone, naturalist or not, could actually expect that a vulture would harm a human, they are big creatures, and so are we, and it takes an animal the size of a tiger to prey on us. Remember that Woolridge had also had a long thought about snow leopards, even though he knew how rare they are, and then remembered that he was all alone up here. Anything that happened to prevent him from returning on time to base, a broken bone, for example, could at the very least occasion an expensive search party, and that, at the very least, could prevent the whole reason for his Himalayan run. As for the most that could happen, that was just about anything that could be imagined. This was not unreasonable fear. It was an extremely mind-concentrating sort of responsibility. Then, a little further on, it was about noon by now, he heard a crash, and what he describes as a long rumbling. My first reaction was that an awful avalanche somewhere, and then I thought, no, it can't be, because nowhere around could I see any sign of any snow movement. Maybe I was trying to rationalize it to myself. I don't know. I put it down to soldiers in the valley dynamiting for roads. He pressed on up the slope, which seemed suddenly to get much steeper. It was also as the sun was shining on it, getting warmer and making Woolridge very nervous. And then, sure enough, stretching across his path was the sweep of debris of a freshly fallen avalanche. I think now, with hindsight, that this was the noise I heard. I went across the next fifty yards or so to get to another spot where the slope evened out so I could get a good view of it and try to work out where it started, what had started it, and what the risks were of something else happening. The thing that really caught my eye was this great big smooth slide in the snow, as if some pretty heavy rock had slid down it. But there was no rock. Where the rock should have been, or where signs that the rock had bounced away should have been, there was nothing, except tracks leading away right from the base of the snow slide across the slope behind a little shrub and beyond it. And right behind the shrub was a shape that couldn't have been a rock. In an unpublished written account of the incident, Woolridge describes this shape as a dark, hairy creature, perhaps up to two meters in height, standing erect on two legs. It had a squarish head and long, powerfully built torso. In talking about it, he also mentions knee-length arms with brown hair on them. Edward W. Cronin, in his book, Erun, The Natural History of the World's Deepest Valley, compiles all of the remarkably consistent recent eyewitness accounts of the Yeti into this description. Its body is stocky, ape-like in shape, with a distinctly human quality to it, in contrast to that of a bear. It stands five and a half to six feet tall and is covered with short, coarse hair, reddish-brown to black in color, sometimes with white patches on the chest. The hair is the longest on the shoulders. The face is hairless and rather flat. The jaw is robust, the teeth are quite large, though fangs are not present, and the mouth is wide. The shape of the head is conical, with a pointed crown. The arms are long, reaching almost to the knees. The shoulders are heavy and hunched. There is no tail. Except for the shape of the head, and it may only have looked flat because it was lowered as the animal peered down the slope, Woolridge's description is a good match for Cronin's composite, something that Woolridge was unaware of before he took off for a run through the Himalayas. He had never thought much about yetis, one way or the other, and, if pressed, would probably have opted for skepticism. I remember how quickly I had to revise my own beliefs. I had to go from the point where I thought 
well, a lot of people have been saying there are these strange footprints and there's got to be some explanation for them. The level at which I knew about these things, to thinking, well, the Yeti must exist because the creature can't be anything else that I know of. It's not a human being, and it's not like any other animal that I've ever heard of. What else can it be? It's a tremendous feeling that having all your doubts and your opinions so shaken into line. Unlike many people who see or claim to see unrecorded by science creatures, even unlike many people who have adventured to wherever they are for the specific purpose of finding and photographing them, Woolridge happened to have both a camera with him and the presence of mind to raise it and snap the shutter. The focus was right and the lens cap was off. In fact, it was a camera with an automatic focus and a lens cap shutter lock, something that ought to be attached by handcuff to every member of the International Society of Cryptozoology. The only problem was the Yeti was standing about 150 meters away on the other side of a non-negotiable avalanche slide. And one thing that Woolrich didn't have with him was a telephoto lens. He had 35 millimeter. The sun was behind the animal. When the film was eventually developed, the image was a silhouette about two meters high. I took a couple of quick photographs because I was certain that whatever it was wasn't going to hang around for very long. But it was still there. So I moved up and got as close as I safely could on the snow. I picked out a spot where some rocks were sticking out, and I was on reasonably solid ground, and I started taking some more photographs. And the longer I was there, the more I felt convinced that the animal was in no hurry at all to move off. It was remarkably stationary. It showed virtually no sign of movement. So I studied it as far as I could and took the best photographs I could, mostly from this rocky area. Then I went back down again to where I had taken the first few and took some more from there. He took a roll of color film and loaded another. The animal remained still. The only sign of movement I saw was I saw the bush vibrate on one occasion, and when I moved lower down I got the impression, no more than that, that it changed its posture and was looking around the other side of the shrub. And you get that impression, too, from the negatives. Woolridge's eyes, there being two of them with fairly high resolution, were doing a better job than the camera. I could get the three-dimensional effect. He could see the brown arms clearly, and what was most clear, I think, were the features of the head. The fact that it was so square, for one thing. One other thing that still puzzles me is why it didn't seem to be looking directly at me. It was looking down the slope. I was convinced, the more I looked at it, that it thought its best chance. Well, I don't know how it thought it could have concealed by instinct, maybe, in order to conceal itself, it freezes. On the other hand, maybe a snow-wise animal that has just been nearly killed in an avalanche knows how to keep another pile of snow from crashing down on it. Maybe it knows to go on to the nearest bush, hang on and stay still until the snow refreezes. Maybe it was wishing that the human over there wouldn't keep jumping around and taking pictures. Or maybe not. All speculations welcome. About 45 minutes passed. The sky began to darken, and it started to snow. Woolridge admits that all things being equal, he might have considered trying the rather dangerous crossing of the avalanche debris and continuing for a little while with his run. He hadn't reached the day's goal, Hemkund, at the valley's cul-de-sac. But that would have meant recrossing the debris later, and the snow would have been even more unstable, and it also would have meant... 
and this was the factor that went furthest towards making all things unequal. Trotting nonchalantly past a yeti, an animal that in some of the stories can fell a yak with a single blow, all in all it seemed a good time to call it a day. On the way down he saw more tracks on the slopes below, but they were distant and inaccessible, and the light was getting worse. He took five or six photos that, when eventually developed, came out black. As he passed the footprints he had seen originally, he took some close-ups, but three hours had passed and the prints were no longer distinct. After administering the monster hunter's time-worn self-kick, he descended towards Gangjaria, the village of the Pulna, and finally Joshamath. At first he thought he would spill the beans down at Pulna and tell everybody what he had seen, and then come back up the next day, maybe, and see what evidence there was. But he decided against that, partly because he was concerned about the animal. If the locals, and especially the soldiers down at Joshamath, decided to set off looking for it, well, you never know what they could have done. And secondly, the weather was turning bad. So he knew that by the next day the footprints would have been snowed over, and provided the animal hadn't been injured, it would have got well away over the call. So there wouldn't have been actually anything to see. He was pretty convinced of that. So I decided to keep the whole thing to myself, to go on and finish the run as if nothing had happened. It was very, very difficult for me because I was bursting to tell. But he kept his secret as he ran through the mountains for several more days, covered his 200 miles and raised 2,300 pounds for tradecraft, 1,300 over his goal. In fact, he more or less kept the secret for four more months. Of course, he had the film developed and took the pictures around to people who had seen or failed to see evidence of yetis, respectively. For example, John Hunt and Chris Bonington. He talked to Dr. Myra Shackley, archaeologist and longtime yeti enthusiast, and to Dr. Brian Bertram, curator of mammals at London Zoo. He talked to other zoologists, anthropologists, and mountaineers, all of whom, he says, seemed fascinated. But he didn't go public, as it were, until he appeared with Chris Bonington on BBC One's Wild Britain in July. Four months seemed plenty of time for the Yeti to have escaped its avalanche and to have returned to that untraceable place where all the Yetis live. But... Mightn't the news now still set off an expedition? I am very concerned that people should think carefully about whether it's really necessary. One of the natural reactions, I think, among scientists, is to say, to be positive about identifying what it is, and in order to find out what we need to do to protect it, we've got to capture one. But it seems to me that in this technological age, we've got such a lot of ways of studying with remote cameras and image intensifiers at night, that sort of thing. I'm not at all sure that it is necessary to capture the animal, particularly one like this, which seems to have been coexisting with man for thousands of years. We don't know how many there are. They certainly can't exist in large numbers, and maybe just taking one out of the population might be enough to destabilize it. He says that he is reporting his experience now, and that he had always intended to report it at some point, so that people take stories of footprints and of other sightings more seriously, and so that the Indian government, perhaps with the help of the World Wildlife Fund, might consider this enough evidence to give the animal protection. In his written account, he ends with a quote from Tillman's book, Mount Everest, 1938. When the dust of conflict had settled, the abominable snowman survived to pursue his evasive, mysterious, terrifying existence, as unruffled as the snow he treads, 
and unmoved as the mountains in which he dwells, uncaught, unspecified, but not without honor. Copyright from BBC Wildlife Magazine, September 1986 issue. This is the end of the first story. Story number two. Field and Stream, January 2000. Print Pro says Bigfoot may exist. Eerily similar tracks are found miles and years apart. Police officer and forensic primate print expert Jimmy Chilcutt of Conroe, Texas, and Dr. Jeff Meldrum, an anatomy and anthropology professor at Idaho State University, share a passion. They examine the prints left by hands and feet to reveal the identity of unseen visitors. But while the testimony of fingerprint expert Chilcutt can prove a person guilty in a court of law, Meldrum's assertions that certain footprints constitute evidence of the legendary Bigfoot's existence raises eyebrows of scientist colleagues. Meldrum hopes some skeptics will change their minds after hearing what Chilcutt has to say about the footprint castings Meldrum has collected from the Pacific Northwest. The ridge detail, finger pattern, on the cast is neither man nor ape, says Chilcutt. Is it possible to have faked it? Sure, but the faker would have had to have an intimate knowledge of primate footprints, and that didn't exist at the time the castings were made. Chilcutt initiated the study of primate fingerprints in the mid-1990s, working on a hunch, the identifying ridge patterns, the articles, loops, and whorls, made by folds in the skin, would someday help forensic specialists catch criminals. He explains that it would be helpful if criminologists could identify the race of a person by his fingerprints. But research in that direction has been inconclusive, Chilcutt believes because the races have interbred so much. Primates, however, have undiluted gene pools. To date, Chilcutt has more than 1,000 fingerprints of lemurs, monkeys, and apes in his computer data bank. When he heard about Bigfoot castings in Meldrum's laboratory, he was intrigued but skeptical. What I do is catch bad guys in Conroe, Texas, Chilcutt says. I didn't care one way or the other if Bigfoot existed. But a casting made near Walla Walla, Washington in 1984 piqued his interest. Not only did the ridge pattern run vertically along the edges of the foot, then angle across underneath the toes, a pattern different from humans and apes, which have ridges running horizontally and at an angle across the foot pad, respectively, but the imprints showed splits in the feet where the ridges did not realign perfectly when the skin had healed. Chilcutt got a second jolt when he found a Northern California casting made in 1967. The pattern was similar to that on the Walla Walla casting, although made from a smaller animal. For them to be fake, Chilcutt believes the same person would have had to fabricate both footprints 17 years and several hundred miles apart. That seemed unlikely to Chilcutt, especially after he tried to duplicate the casting and failed. The fingerprints expert has become a believer. I can assure you, he says, there's an animal up in the Pacific Northwest that we have never seen. Keith McCafferty, Copyright, Field and Stream Magazine. That's the end of story number two. Story number three, Mount St. Helens, Ape Cave. Ape Cave in the Gifford Pinchot National Forest went unnoticed for about 2,000 years. Then, in 1951, Larry Johnson of Amboy, Washington, was logging in the area when he discovered the entrance to the Lava Tube Cave, which was at the time almost completely blocked with vegetation and timber growth. Johnson then related the find to the Harry Reese family, and they investigated and explored what is now known as Ape Cave. Why is it called Ape Cave? Well, Harry Reese was a scoutmaster of a Boy Scout troop called 
the apes, so named because of their interest in the legend of Mount St. Helens and its Native American tales of old Sasquatch. Thus the cave they explored in those years was tagged Ape Cave, after the scout troop of that day. Contrary to a published Bigfoot book, the 1924 Fred Beck story in Ape Canyon was not the motivation for the naming of the 1951 Ape Cave. The canyon story was on the other side of the Mammoth Mountain from Ape Cave. The scouts were influenced by the Native Americans and their campfire stories, which did not include Fred Beck, but rather focused on Native encounters with what they perceived as the mountain's hairy apes in the 1950s. There are no stories to support the notion that Sasquatches ever inhabited Ape Cave. The cave itself was formed 2,000 years ago. What is now a cave was once a stream bed. An eruption from the mountain's summit filled the gully with lava, which did not harden consistently. As the outward part of the flow cooled and hardened, the inner strand kept moving out the bottom of the cave. The lava flowed for three to six months, resulting in the cave as we know it today. At 12,810 feet, it is the longest such formation in North America. Walls average 30 feet thick. The forest grew up and over the main entrance until it was discovered by Lawrence Larry Johnson in 1951. In a roundabout way, it was indeed named after the legendary Sasquatch by way of a Boy Scout troop named the Apes. According to Native American legend, those apes were the elusive Sasquatch. This is the end of story number three. Story number four. Surgeon teams with filmmaker to find Almasty. Newspaper, the Long Beach Press Telegram. Article titled, Big Hunt for Bigfoot's Kin. Published Sunday, March 29, 1992, Associated Press. A spirited 72-year-old doctor and a filmmaker are teaming up for a summer expedition to track the Almasty, or snowman of the Caucasus a huge, hairy beast with glowing red eyes, the hominid cousin of Yeti and Bigfoot. Dr. Jean-Marie Kaufman, a French-Russian surgeon, mountaineer, and scholar, has been on the Almasty Trail for more than two decades and has collected more than 500 accounts and a plaster-cast footprint of the forest man of the Caucasus. She traveled on horseback through the remote mountains between the Black and Caspian Seas, talking to villagers who had seen the mysterious beast. Although skeptical at first, she became convinced that the Almasty was another in an array of species that roamed the Caucasian wilds. Retiring in France on a tiny Soviet pension, she never dreamed that one day she'd have the money to mount a full-scale scientific search. But then she had not counted on Sylvan Pallax. Pallax, a documentary filmmaker, was fascinated by two articles Kaufman wrote for Archaeologia magazine. Tracking her down, he proposed finding sponsors for an expedition that he would film. The respected French paleoanthropologist, Yves Copens, gave the search his blessing. Pallax raised half of the needed 1.8 million. He's confident he'll find the rest. For three weeks, the telephone has been ringing off the hook, said Pallax whose previous works have included a documentary on a Harley-Davidson meet in South Dakota and one on Calvados moonshiners. People are fascinated by the Almasty. A dozen people will leave Paris in June to be joined by a dozen of Kaufman scientific colleagues from Moscow. They will conduct the research in the kabardin balkart region of Russia, just north of Georgia. The expedition hopes to find the beast put it to sleep, take blood and skin samples and a plaster cast of the face and then let it awake in freedom after putting on a band so its wanderings can be followed. Appearing like a cross between an ape and a Neanderthal, the Almasty reputedly can run up to 37 miles an hour. 
It is said to be omnivorous and sometimes travels with companions and babies. The last sighting of the Almasty was by a zoologist friend of Kaufman, who reported spending six minutes watching one on August 25, 1991. That's the end of story number four. Story number five. Argosy Magazine, April 1969. Wisconsin's Abominable Snowman by Ivan T. Sanderson, Science Editor. Argosy investigates a startling report of a dozen reliable witnesses and finds these remarkable tracks. My question was addressed to six of the men seated around the microphone, and it was deliberately somewhat vague. It was, Gentlemen, before we get down to the facts, I want each of you who were on the hunt to tell me, one at a time, what you first thought this creature was when you spotted it. Richard and Pete Vandenberg, Bob Perry, Dick Blyer, Bill Mallow, and Dick Tillock took their time in answering, but all their answers were legitimate because they gave me their first impressions first and then their efforts at rationalizing. For three of those present, it was a second encounter, which I did not discover until later. These three are local men and were hunting in the same swamp known as the Deltox Marsh in which they, in company with nine others, encountered the creature again on a deer drive on November 30th. All three spontaneously said that their first impression was one of complete incomprehension. They didn't know what it was. Bob Perry, who was up in a tree scanning the huge swamp with its stands of trees and meandering tongues of bushes and scrub, saw it first and had it under observation at the closest range and for the longest time. He said his second impression, when he had recovered from his initial surprise, was that it was a lone hunter dressed in a very silly way. Both Dick Blyer and Bill Mallow, having seen it from the ground, and much less clearly, due to the patches of bushes, could only give their rather long accounts of their first attempt at rationalization, and during this both thought it might be a bear, but, they added, they had immediately changed this to some crazy hunter or more like an ape. By the time of the deer drive, six weeks later, these three had all come to the conclusion that it was not a bear because of its very long legs and the speed and silence with which it moved which our black bear cannot do when standing upright, nor a hunter. This puzzled me, especially because the other three present, who had seen it only once on the drive, all said that their first impression had been of a bear standing upright. But when it sort of danced around and then got in behind the bushes, as Dick Tellick put it, their second thoughts also were that it was a man. When it came to third and subsequent thoughts, all six reached the conclusion that it was neither bear nor man, and they debated the possibilities for us around the microphone. Finally, they came up with a combined notion, approved by all present, that it was some kind of a man that behaved like an ape, and more particularly like a chimpanzee. This, of course, prompted my next and most obvious question. You mean a man wearing a monkey suit, putting on a sort of act? There was a guffaw from everybody at the table, except my traveling companion, Dr. Bernard Huvelmans, of the Royal Institute of National Sciences of Belgium, who has spent a lifetime tracking down reported but as yet uncaught animals. Joining most heartily in this explosion was Larry McEvitt, a police officer and local game warden who had actually supervised the drive. Accompanying this outburst were cries of, It would have been suicide! Somewhat taken aback, and asking what this was all about, I got the answer, You don't know the hunters who come up here in the deer season, and it's the truth. Anybody who dressed themselves up in a monkey suit 
and then danced around in the open in front of a line of even local hunters, giving his famous imitation of a dancing bear or a distraught escaped ape, could only be intent on suicide. Not even an escapee from a city on his first hunt would wear his wife's fur coat or a furry parka. Twelve men made a drive through this Deltox marsh, moving abreast at about twenty paces apart. The game warden was out to observe the start of the drive, just to check out the hunters and see that all was legal and in order, but he remained on one of the roads that surrounded the swamp. He did not see the creature, and he had gone elsewhere by the time the party came out at the other end of the swamp about three miles away. This swamp, some four by two miles in extent, is surrounded by farmlands dotted with numerous woods, thickets, and marshes, which are overgrown with three to four foot tall canary grass. There are two large spring-filled dew ponds, locally called fountains, in this swamp, one to the north, one to the near center. In addition to the six men already named, there were on the drive Kurt Kruger, Artie Tellock, Lester Zulhaik, Don Scania, Romy Scanvi, and a visitor from Milwaukee. An interesting point is that their ages range from 12 to 55, and three of them have been in the armed forces. All saw the thing at the same time, though some closer than others, and some for a longer time. Oldon Savina and Artitelic got too dim a sight of it to comment. Shortly after entering the more open grass field center area of the swamp, the three on the left suddenly spotted something black standing in the grass, which reached only about halfway up its thighs. They didn't shoot. It was manlike. Confused, they called the line to a halt and passed the word along. The creature then began to walk to their left. Moving forward as quietly as possible, they wheeled around and got very close to it. The creature then began to retreat, but when they stopped, it stopped and when they moved back, it came toward them. It finally moved into the thickets in the direction of some woodland to the northwest. They tried to follow, but the brush was too thick, so they circled around as fast as they could with a view to heading it off or to be waiting for it to emerge on the road beyond, on which, incidentally, they had left their cars. There they watched for a considerable time, but it did not appear. The composite description of the creature that emerged was that of a large and powerfully built man covered with short, very dark brown or black hair, and, as invariably in descriptions of these creatures, with a lighter and hairless face and hairless palms. The head appeared smallish, also with short hair, but the neck appeared to be enormous and so short as to be almost non-existent. The shoulders were very wide and large and the torso barrel-shaped. In a six-way discussion at our interview, some time was spent on the proportionate length of the arms, body, and legs. Analyzing this exchange from the tape, it seems that while the body seemed to be very long, this was due to the absence of any noticeable waist. All of them said that it tapered from the shoulders right to the hips. As for a description of the legs, they could only guess since the creature was standing in grass, which they estimated to be between three and four feet tall. Some at first said the legs were short, others that they were long, but this was before they decided that they should speak of their length in proportion to the body rather than in comparison to a man or an ape. Then they all agreed that they would be of about average length for a tall man, since the grass did not reach to the crotch. But it was concerning the arms that all seemed agreed, feeling that they were exceptionally long for a man. Now, I can vouch for these young men's honesty, their sincerity and exceptional intelligence, because we gave them a pretty thorough and skillful interrogation. Bernard Huvelmans was once nicknamed the Sherlock Holmes of zoology on his French TV science series. Trained zoologists can set some deadly traps for non-zoologists. 
This may be summarized. First, they agreed. It did not seem to be afraid. And they felt sure it had seen them from the outset. Its movements were almost leisurely, and it seemed to deliberately come out from behind the bushes several times to observe them. Altogether it impressed them, as it had done the three previously in October, as being distinctly curious and even inquisitive and rather bold in its approach to them, though duly cautious in that it retreated before them and kept at a safe distance. Of its body motions they had much to say. It walked just like a man, but slightly forward and with a sort of swinging motion of the arms. On more than one occasion it seemed deliberately to try to attract their attention by sort of jumping around. Now, all this, and a tremendous amount of further hints and details contained in our taped record, on analysis adds up to but one thing, a hominid. This means something on the human branch of the general anthropoid tree rather than on that of the apes or pongids. In view of the fact that there never have been any wild apes in North America, and that they are very valuable specimens in zoos, circuses, and laboratories, that if one got away, it would be immediately reported, and also because it is very doubtful that any known ape could survive in Wisconsin into the fall. This leaves us with only two alternatives. Either it was a deranged person in a monkey suit attempting suicide, or it was one of the half-dozen or so kinds of man-creatures that we call collectively ABSMs, abominable snowmen. Finally, it came as a considerable surprise to us to learn during the interview I describe above that this particular specimen, or one just like it, was seen on no less than five occasions in that immediate area last fall. Sometime in the early fall, a Mr. Freeman encountered just the same thing in an area known as the Lebanon Swamp. Perry, Flyer, and Mallow ran into it on the 19th of November. There was this drive on the 30th of November, and the very next night a Mr. and Mrs. Stan Pencala almost ran into it on one of the nearby roads. Then, as we were concluding our interview... Four young local men came in to say that some youngsters had just led them to two long trails of tracks in the fresh but slightly crusted snow, again adjacent to the Deltox Marsh. I'm afraid that this development seemed too pat. We went to see the tracks, and they displayed some very dubious features that would have been puzzling enough if they had been found on the top of the Himalayas. But... By this I mean they looked more than suspiciously man-made, in that they were enormous individually, but had exactly the same stride as my own. While both sets either appeared out of deep wood into which we had not the time or means at night to follow them back to their point of origin, or started from a blacktop road and cut across open fields to another thick wood. Also, on one occasion they stepped over a waist-high barbed wire fence without messing the snow or leaving any hairs. But perhaps we went to look at these tracks in too skeptical a mood, and our appraisal may have been prejudiced. Copyright Argosy Magazine Ivan Sanderson Sanderson, Ivan Terrence, 1911-1973 through Sanderson received degrees with honors in geology, zoology, and botany, and headed six expeditions in all parts of the world for such groups as the British Museum, Cambridge, and London Universities, the Linnaean Societies of London, and the Chicago Natural History Museum. He was the author of many books. One, Animal Treasures, was a book of the month selection in 1937. Others include The Hairy Primitives of Ancient Europe, 1967, Caribbean Treasure, Animals Nobody Knows, Living Treasure, Animal Tales, How to Know American Mammals, The Monkey Kingdom, 
and living mammals of the world. The Abominable Snowmen, Legend Come to Life, written in 1961, and countless articles for various publications and Argosy magazine, where he was science editor. This concludes the reading of the five stories. Thank you for listening. Welcome. This encounter is brought to you by William Jevning and is entitled Tracks Found 2001 on Payne Ranch, Cavello, Mendocino County, California. Mendocino National Forest. September 2001. 1700 hours. Nearest water, Skunk Lake. Closest road would be NFS Road, M1. I was deer hunting in an area known as the Payne Ranch when I observed a single track on the bank of the creek. I have been hunting for 20 years and have taken several bears over the years in this area. At first I thought I was looking at a bear track. I was approximately 10 feet from the track when I saw it. As I got closer, I realized that it was much larger than a black bear track. It was located in a muddy, sandy spot between some rocks. I inspected the track and discovered that it was approximately four times as long as a 7 millimeter Remington Magnum shell case and approximately two and a half cases in width near the toes. It had the appearance of a distorted human foot with a distinct large toe on the right side and four smaller digits to the right of the larger digit. The ground was dry enough that there was no water within the impression. This area is fairly remote and I did not encounter any other hunters in the area. I searched the surrounding stream bed for more tracks but did not locate any. I did not have a camera with me to photograph the track. This area is a very dense wooded location. It has a tree canopy of oak, pine, bay, and cedar. The rocks were all covered with moss due to the shade, and although it was September, it was easily 15 degrees cooler within the creek bed. There are numerous caverns and many deadfalls along the stream. Water is available here year-round. The banks ascend at approximately 50 degrees away from the stream. I believe it's made up of volcanic rock. I never saw a source of the print. However, I did note that while there, the surrounding woods were very quiet. No sound of birds or squirrels or frogs. I am very aware of sound while hunting and have noticed that when a large predatory animal is nearby, smaller animals become quiet. I stayed in the immediate area for almost an hour, hoping to get a glimpse of what I know made this track, but did not see or hear it. I did hear what sounded like a dog panting at one point above me, but it was for only a few seconds. I returned to the site the next morning, but did not find any other tracks. I relocated my original track site, but it had changed drastically due to an evening thunderstorm. I returned to the same area during the second week of November for a late season archery deer hunt. It snowed while I was there, and I brought a camera hoping to locate another track, but I did not. I am of the firm belief that this track was made by an animal other than a bear or human. I can only say that it has impacted me greatly. I hope to re-encounter this forest creature again. Hopefully I will have my rifle or bow at the ready to provide final proof and documentation to all. I know that many would feel that shooting a Sasquatch would be wrong, but if the opportunity presented itself, should it be done? I spent 11 years as a sheriff's deputy and would exercise extreme caution before shooting at the unknown. I just feel that an actual specimen would end all of the speculation and prove the creature is real. I have had several discussions with my fellow hunting partners and we all agree that if we observed one over a period of time in a remote location from a short distance and positively knew it not to be some idiot in an ape suit, we would shoot it. How do you feel about this? I've heard that Patterson had a rifle with him at Bluff Creek and shot film rather than bullets. Frankly, I didn't really believe in this until that track was there for my own eyes to witness. Now I can't help but observe the wilderness differently. 
I wonder all the time if I will someday actually see what made that print. As a hunter, all I can say is, we deal in lead, friend. I would feel much more at ease talking about seeing Bigfoot with one on the cover of National Geographic after a sportsman killed one. To conclude, I hope that someone is able to capture one or film one over several days to provide further evidence so that none have to be needlessly killed. But I feel it's probably the only way to end this conclusively. Vince Crudell. Welcome. This story is being brought to you by William Jevening and is being narrated by Jim Sower. This is the Ruby Creek story. Stories about the Sasquatch have been appearing in print from time to time since the 1860s, and I have clippings in my files from almost every year since the early 1920s. But the modern history of the Sasquatch really dates from September 1941, when one of these creatures paid a visit in broad daylight to an Indian family named Chapman. While the Amerindian stories have usually been dismissed as legend, or laughed off because uh, they're not supposed to be reliable, this experience was accompanied by too much physical evidence to be ignored. The Chapman family consisted of George and Jeannie Chapman, and children numbering, at my visit, four. Mr. Chapman worked on the railroad, and was living at that time in a small place called Ruby Creek, 30 miles up the Fraser River from Agassiz, British Columbia, in Canada's Great Western Province. It was about three in the afternoon of a sunny, cloudless day when Jeannie Chapman's eldest son, then age nine, came running to the house saying that there was a cow coming down out of the woods at the foot of the nearby mountain. The other kids, the boy age seven, and a little girl of five were still playing in a field behind the house bordering on the rail track. Miss Chapman went out to look. Since the boy seemed oddly disturbed, and they saw what at first she thought was a very big bear moving about among the bushes bordering on the field beyond the railway tracks, she called the two children who came running immediately. Then the creature moved onto the tracks, and she saw, to her horror, that it was a gigantic man covered with hair, not fur. The hair seemed to be about four inches long all over, and of a pale yellow-brown color. To pin down this color, Mrs. Chapman pointed out to me a sheet of lightly varnished plywood in the room where we were sitting. This was of a brown okra color. This creature advanced directly towards the house, and Mrs. Chapman had, as she put it, much too much time to look at it, because she stood her ground outside while the eldest boy, on her instructions, got a blanket from the house and rounded up the other children. The kids were in a near panic, she told us, and it took two or three minutes to get the blanket during which time the creature had reached the near corner of the field only about 100 feet away from her. Mrs. Chapman then spread the blanket and, holding it aloft so the kids could not see the creature, or it them, she backed off at the double to the old field and down onto the river beach out of sight, and then ran with the kids downstream to the village. I asked her a leading question about the blanket, had her purpose in using it been to prevent her kids seeing the creature, in accordance with an alleged Amerindian belief that to do so brings bad luck and often death? Her reply was both prompt and surprising. She said that, although she had heard white men tell of that belief, she had not heard it from her parents or any other of her people whose advice regarding the so-called Sasquatch had been simply not to go further then certain points up certain valleys, to run if she saw one, and not to struggle if one caught her as it might squeeze her to death by mistake. No, she said. I used the blanket because I thought it was after one of the kids, and so might go into the house to look for them instead of following me. This seems to have been sound logic, as the creature did go into the house, 
and also rummaged through an old outhouse pretty thoroughly, hauling from it a 55-gallon barrel of salt fish, breaking this open and scattering its contents about outside. The irony of it is that all three children did die within three years, the two boys by drowning and the little girl on a sick bed. And just after I interviewed the Chapmans, they also were drowned in the Fraser River when a rowboat capsized. Mrs. Chapman told me that the creature was about seven and a half feet tall. She could estimate its height by the various fence and line posts standing about the field. It had a rather small head and a very short, thick neck. In fact, really, no neck at all, a point that was emphasized by William Rowe and by all others who claimed to have seen one of these creatures. Its body was entirely human in shape, except that it was immensely thick through its chest and its arms were exceptionally long. She did not see the feet, which were in the grass. Its shoulders were very wide, and it had no breasts, from which Mrs. Chapman assumed it was a male, though she did not see any male genitalia due to the long hair covering its groin. She was most definite on one point. The naked parts of its face and its hands were much darker than its hair, and appeared to be almost black. George Chapman returned home from his work on the railroad that day shortly before six in the evening and by a route that bypassed the village so that he saw no one to tell him what had happened. When he reached his house, he immediately saw the woodshed door battered in and spotted enormous humanoid footprints all over the place. Greatly alarmed, for he, like all of his people, had heard since childhood about the big wild men of the mountains, though he did not hear the word Sasquatch till after this incident. He called for his family, and then dashed through the house. Then he spotted the foot tracks of his wife and kids going off toward the river. He followed these until he picked them up on the sand beside the river and saw them going off downstream without any giant ones following. Somewhat relieved, he was retracing his steps when he stumbled across the giant's foot tracks on the river bank farther upstream. These had come down out of the potato patch, which lay between the house and the river, had milled about by the river, and then gone back through the old field toward the foot of the mountains, where they disappeared in the heavy growth. Returning to the house, relieved to know that the tracks of all four of his children and family had gone off downstream to the village, George Chapman went to examine the woodshed. In our interview after 18 years, he still expressed voluble astonishment that any living thing, even a 7 foot 6 inch man with the barrel chest, could lift a 55 gallon tub of fish and break it open without using a tool. He confirmed the creature's height after finding a number of long brown hairs stuck in the slabwood lintel of the doorway above the level of his head. George Chapman then went off to the village to look for his family, and found them in a state of calm collapse. He gathered them up and invited his father-in-law and two others to return with him for protection of his family when he was away at work. The foot tracks returned every night for a week, and on two occasions the dogs that the Chapmans had taken with them set up the most awful racket at exactly two o'clock in the morning. The Sasquatch did not, however, molest them or apparently touch either the house or the woodshed. But the whole business was too unnerving, and the family finally moved out. They never went back. After a long chat about this and other matters, Mrs. Chapman suddenly told us something very significant just as we were leaving. She said, It made an awful funny noise. I asked her if she could imitate this noise for me, but it was her husband who did so, saying that he had heard it at night twice during the week after the first incident. He then proceeded to utter exactly the same strange, gurgling whistle that the men in California, who said they had heard a Bigfoot call, had given us. This is a sound I cannot reproduce in print, but 
I can assure you that it is unlike anything I have ever heard given by man or beast anywhere in the world. To me this information is of greatest significance. That an Amerindian couple in British Columbia should give out with exactly the same strange sound in connection with the Sasquatch that two highly educated white men did over 600 miles south in connection with California's Bigfoot is incredible. If this is all hoax, or a publicity stunt, or a mass hallucination, as some people have claimed, how does it happen that this noise, which defies description, always sounds the same no matter who has tried to reproduce it for me? These were probably the last words on the Sasquatch that the Chapmans uttered, and I absolutely refuse to listen to anybody who might say that they were lying. Admittedly, Honest men are such a rarity as possibly to be non-existent. But I have met a few who could qualify, and I put the Chapmans near the head of that list. This story was written by Ivan T. Sanderson in True Magazine, March 1960. This concludes the reading of Ruby Creek. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then... <laughs>